Four players from my Barstool Sports. Ladies and gentlemen, we had a very big announcement uh, just yesterday, Tuesday, I guess. This show is coming out on Thursday. Uh, so it's just me for right now. Um, but we have the entire squad for about a two-hour show. Essentially what happened was we recorded on Tuesday. We got Fixing Frankie. We got Breaking 90 going on. So people were out filming. We needed to get some recording done so we could put out a podcast. And then, of course, the news broke of who was going to be in the first Live Golf event, which included Dustin Johnson, a massive name. Uh, so obviously I'm going to give you my thoughts on that. We also have two phenomenal interviews on this show. We have Taylor Montgomery, um, Corn Ferry Tour uh, Bubble Boy the last few years, has his tour card pretty much locked up for next year, so we get a very uh, unique perspective. It's not, you know, some PGA Tour guy just won a PGA Tour event. It's Corn Ferry Tour player who's finally going to break through, who's had a lot of close calls, um, super nice guy. And then we have Rachel Heck, who is one of the best female amateur golfers in the country, uh, won the NCAA Division One individual title last year, team title just last week at Greyhawk with Stanford. She's awesome. She's unbelievably nice and has a million things going on. She's really impressive. So we have an interview with her. And then we also have a full show where we do all of our usual bullshit that we usually do. Um, quick announcement, and you're going to see that we debated if we should announce this, not announce it. There's a billion different things going on. We don't really know what we're doing. We never knew what we're doing. But the live show at the Wilbur Theater, which is the Monday night of U.S. Open week, June uh, 13th, 2022 coming up pretty quickly we're going to announce our special guests which are kirk minahan and kevin kisner kirk minahan is obviously a boston guy he's podcast jesus and he is a huge golf nut in fact i was listening to a show a week or two ago where he just came out and said i know a lot more about golf than Riggs does which may or may not be true i don't really give a shit kirk's phenomenal he's hilarious he's relentless he's fearless and he's a boston nut he's got his own shows coming up at the wilbur i asked him if he would do it he immediately said absolutely he would love to do it so kirk will be there and then kevin kisner he's he's our guy we have i'm wearing pride of aiken shirt right now ain't no hobby our entire history film and videos the original four-man scramble battle we've stayed at his house we know his family uh he's a no-brainer so we got kirk we got kids at the live show at the Wilbur. So go get your tickets if you have not yet. It'll be the Monday night of US Open Week, which is coming up in a little under two weeks. All right, the Live Golf announcement. So um, overall, I wouldn't say a ton of surprises. Kind of a lot of names that you would suspect that we already expected. People that had pretty much either hinted at or uh, flat out said that that's what they're going to do. One of the, uh, the, the biggest uh, opposition or contradiction to that is Dustin Johnson. DJ was rumored forever leading up to this entire thing uh, to be one of the guys for, I think, a lot of obvious reasons, people to just know DJ and his image and his um, just general perception. We're like, oh, yeah, I could see Dustin Johnson going and doing that. I don't think he really gives a shit. He wants to make money. If that's his prerogative, people can judge. People will judge. People are dropping him, but good for him. He's going to make a bunch of money. Well, then he came out in February, which I believe was February 20th. He put out a statement uh, that said he was pledging his allegiance to the PGA Tour. He said over the past few months, there's been a great deal of speculation about an alternative tour, much of which seems to have included me and my future professional golf. I feel it is now time to put speculation to rest. I am fully committed to the PGA Tour. <clears throat> Now, here we are. That was February 20th. This is June 1st, and I'm responding to him coming out and playing and getting a reported $125-ish million deal to go and play on the Live Saudi Golf Tour. RBC, one of his sponsors, terminated him, terminated Graham McDowell. Um, DJ has won the RBC Canadian Open before. Uh, they said, the RBC said, as a result of the decision made by professional golfers Dustin Johnson and Graham McDowell to play the LIV, the Live Golf Invitational Series opener, RBC is terminating its sponsorship agreement with both players. We wish them well in their future endeavors. <clears throat> Clearly, this is going to happen. Everybody knew this was going to fucking happen. And it could seem like a blow. But at the end of the day, if Dustin Johnson is getting $125 million dollars if you look at the money list leader in history, which is Tiger Woods, good friend of ours, my brother, $120 million of career earnings on the PGA Tour. Dustin Johnson is actually third all-time with $74 million. So for a deal, for him to go over and play for a year, a couple of years, not even that long, not forever, not even as long as it took him to come up with $74 million, not even close, he's going to make $125 
million dollars. Kyle Porter from CBS, uh, he tweeted out, DJ has made $1.8 million in 11 events so far this year. If he averages a fourth-place finish in the Live League, he'll make $133 million in eight events the rest of the way, not including team payouts or either Open. Obviously, talk about the U.S. Open and the Open Championship. <clears throat> so, clearly, from a financial standpoint, DJ was just like, I don't give a shit. That's what I'm doing. Uh, he came out with a statement from his agent uh, that said Dustin has been contemplating the opportunity off and on the course for a couple years. Ultimately, he decided it was in his and his family's best interest to pursue it. Uh, Dustin has never had any issue with the PGA Tour and is grateful for all it has given him, but in the end, felt this was too compelling to pass up. So that was an interesting statement to me because basically that statement is saying, yeah, no, he gets that this is pretty much giving up the PGA Tour. So now is Dustin Johnson just – not on the PGA Tour anymore. The Tour did come out with a statement that said, you know, we made it very clear uh, that we're not allowing people, our members, to play in this event, uh, which means that they will face disciplinary action. Now, what that means, if that's like a slap on the wrist, if that's a permanent ban, who the fuck knows what that's going to mean? Taylor Gooch, I think, was the other surprising name. He's like best friends with Max Homa. Um, we had him on the show. He won a PGA Tour event. Uh, just not a name that you expected to go over there. He's obviously not a juggernaut. He's not some mega star in the golf world at least not yet uh but a name that i think a lot of people did not expect to see on the list and then other notables you got sergio garcia kevin na louis Oosterhuizen, ian poulter hudson swafford lee westwood but again most of those names i feel like people kind of already expected or suspected phil mickelson not on the list i found that to be a little bit surprising uh and then again there's also a little caveat a little uh open-ended to this to the release which was and it was released on like a like a word doc spreadsheet thing which is very funny uh but it said commissioners invites and bursts following the result of the asian tour national there's still six spots for commissioners invites and bursts following the results of the asian tour international series england tournament june 2nd through the 5th um so that's kind of where we're at with the entire thing dj's the big name dj's what everybody's tweeting about talking about texting about very surprising move just in the sense that DJ released a fucking statement in February saying he wasn't doing this, he's pledging his allegiance, and then just is doing it. Um, it's a lot of money. We all understand money talks, um, but surprising for a lot of those reasons. And then uh, I think the biggest question, which I imagine we'll debate and we'll talk about a lot, is what's the USGA and the RNA going to do? They are both the US Open and the Open Championship. They are open championships, which means they're open to people that can qualify or people that have qualified, a.k.a. past champion. DJ um, won at Oakmont. He's a U.S. Open champion. Um, so will they come out and now say these these guys can't play? If they don't, then all of a sudden you can play in all the majors um, and you could go make $125 million. That might be pretty um, compelling is the word that everybody's using. Compelling to a lot more guys. Um, and Chase Kepka, he's a name that's interesting. He's like a millionth in the world rankings. He doesn't have much career earnings ever. And now he might go over, clearly, when it comes to golf accomplishments at this point, the worst of the two brothers. He might go over to um, the Live League and just start making millions and millions of dollars. If that's the case, and you're looking at Brooks Kepka is going to look at that. Other guys like Brooks Kepka are going to look at that and be like, what the hell am I doing? Um, so things are happening. The field has been announced. I think one name really stands out above the rest, which is very clear. Um, you're going to now hear on the show that we didn't know this list at this point. We kind of said if it comes out, we'll talk about it. Um, so that's kind of what we've got at this point. we got a full show, full lid, if you will, uh, of things to get to. We laugh. We cry. Well, we don't cry. Uh, but we have a good time. we got a couple interviews. So enjoy the rest of the podcast. We've got two guests in this show. we got Taylor Montgomery, Corn Ferry Tour, finished 26th in both the uh, regular season and the finals last year, which is missing out on his PGA Tour card by one spot. Uh, also finished runner-up, I believe, three times in the Corn Ferry Tour last year. Phenomenal year this year. He's going to have his PGA Tour card. So we talk all about that process. Super nice guy. Super nice guy. Um, and we get some good tales and stories, and he's a Vegas guy. And then we have Rachel Heck, who we've not interviewed yet. Uh, she won, I believe, low... NCAA champion last year uh, as a freshman at Stanford. Stanford women's golf just won the NCAA championships as teams this year. I think she's like number three amateur in the world. And then she's also the first ever Nike golf NIL athlete uh, as a sophomore at Stanford. So she's got a, a really cool career and she's just an angel and an unbelievably nice person. So excited to interview her. We got two big videos. We've got uh, Matt Wolf has come out. It came out on Tuesday night. 
blindfolded golf tailor made. And then we got tonight, Trent Ryan is attempting to break 90. He is beginning his run by going down, seeing old JT rekindling the flame and seeing what he's got. Yeah, it's, it's going to be good. I think it'll be, you know, we did some similar stuff to last time where we just hung out and he taught me how to be better at golf. And that was, that's pretty much what we did. And we had a good time. We played a few holes, saw what my game was like and kind of went from there. So yeah, I'm very excited for people to see it. I'm very excited to start this journey. Um, yeah, it's going to be great. And now we're just going to keep rolling. We're going to start playing rounds. And I'm just going to, at some point, I'm going to try to basically beat Frankie. I, I, that's kind of what it's going to come down to. Did you're, you're definitely. Out again? What? <laughs> you go, Frank. No, I, well, I was going to respond to Trent saying he's going to beat me. At some point, I think it's just going to happen. Like, I don't know how much. You're definitely advancing in your game faster than I am. I'm in a spot where my game, I'm trying to get it to a level where it'd be like considered good golf. I think right now I play inconsistently good golf, but like I want to be able to play good golf. I want to be a good golfer. Many times, we just filmed episode two of our Fixing Frankie many times. Many times, my guy Scott Fawcett said, well, you're not a good golfer, so we have to blank. And then we, he just kept saying that to the point where I almost cried. I want to get mm-hmm. to the point where I'm a good golfer, and I think that's going to take me longer than when you. What do you consider a me. good golfer? Where would you? How would you? How would you classify a good golfer? Good golfer uh, it depends on who you're asking. If you're asking me, I would say anyone that's a five hand, like a seven handicap and down. Like if you're like consistently in the low mid 80s, I think that's a good golfer. I think you're playing yeah, say- good golf. If somebody shows up and every time they tee it up, you believe they're a legitimate threat to break 80, I would say that's like that's a good player. Yeah. If you ask Maybe Kisner, I, he's going to be like, you have to like break fucking par every time. No. I think sub. I think a single-digit handicap is like a good golfer, like 10 and below. You think Kevin Kisner would say a nine handicap is a good golfer? Like I, think guy, he, I think he could wrap his – he doesn't think everybody – to be constituted as a good golfer has to be on the PJ tour. I well, don't me, think he let, thinks that. No, I don't think so either. But let me ask you that somebody you're, um, you're at a bar, you're with a friend and he says, uh, Oh, I got this really good buddy. Uh, he's hilarious. He's a great guy. He's a good player too. What does that mean? Like right away, what is your, what are you expecting when you go, Oh, what's his handicap? Like, what are you expecting that number? What's the highest that number would be? Seven. I'm, a, I'm officially a USGA 10 now, and I do not consider myself a good golfer. It's I don't crazy, know that I ever Because you're in, like, the top 10%, maybe, like, top 5% of all golfers. Totally. I just think if you have, like, the, the tier system of, like, horrific, bad, average, good, then, like, there's great. And I think if you're giving people that are, like, a 9 or a 10 the good spot – then like the jump to greatness is True. way too much. Like you need to have, you have to be even between each section. So the fact that you're going to like, what would you consider great? Yeah. Cause if someone says he's a great player, that guy better be Ooh. a scratch or better. I would say. Right. Yeah. I think then so. it's like, then it's like unbelievable. <laughs> and then it's the best. So <laughs> you're telling me I'm only two. Yeah, I, I think off? that's I actually sad. right. I agree with that. Yeah, I think, I that's, think that's right. right. But, I think you're but a good golfer, unbelievable you're like, is like plus, unbelievable is like plus two, and then like the best is like plus seven. But like you're so you're telling me I'm not that far off by being good? No, I'm I'm, I'm average. I'm an average golfer. I don't. No, I, I think average is is ten to fifteen. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, I think like uh, if somebody's like a 12, 13 handicap, I think they're like an average. Pretty, yeah, they're kind of an average golfer that goes out and plays a decent amount. I think, yeah, I think you're right. You start to get a single digit. Somebody's like a legitimate eight. You're pretty good. That's a good player. And then you get like somebody's a fucking zero. I think we're all like, That's, he's a great player. And then anything above that, I mean, you play college, you're playing pro. Like you're just, if you're like a plus two. I mean, you're now you're not even a player. You're just. That's what you do. No, I think you're unbelievable at that point. <laughs> like, oh, does he golf? He's unbelievable. <laughs> like, that's like, people can't believe literally what's what you're saying. Oh, what is he? He's a plus two. Woof. That's that's yeah. golf. 
All right, so you guys give your give your rankings. I've cut you off. I actually kind of I like bump mine out. Like in terms of average, I think it's I think average is between ten and eighteen, like to like the bogey range, to up to you know like ninety five somewhere in there. And then I think a good player is ten to scratch. It's ten to a two, I would say. A great player is like a 1.2, you know, like a two handicap to kind of like a plus one and then great players beyond that. And below average is 18 plus. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're above 18, you suck, right? I mean, (laughs) no, I think that's below average. I think you suck is like 24 and worse. If you're a 19 handicap, I would say you suck at golf. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so telling, telling someone that they suck at golf is but like off the tongue funny I don't in know. general. <laughs> but I would say like I there are many times where I show up and it's like you suck. I suck at golf today. I just suck. And I would Dude. say if you're you're like potentially like 19 means your potential is the night. That's your potential is like you shoot 19 <laughs> over par. I mean you suck at that point. I think yeah. everybody kind of would agree with that. No. T. I don't know. I would say no, because suck implies that you like, you just don't even know what's going on. Trent, do you, did you, before you broke a hundred, did you suck? I mean, probably. Yeah. I got my, I, I played with my buddy Rob the other day and he's worse than he's the worst. He sucks. He couldn't even hit the ball. This is Rob who doesn't smile. I just we, yeah. like he's just nothing is going right for him except for the fucking Rangers, which we can get to. Then he's Let's tall, go. right? He's tall, but he's losing all his hair. He <laughs> nothing wrong with that. He just couldn't hit the golf ball. So like that's something below suck. I think if you Horrible. play the game, just that's horrific. That, horrific. That guy doesn't play. <laughs> Horrific. He's horrific. So like I don't think it's fair to call like he's gonna be below suck. Like like if you play the game and you're just not good, I think you suck. There's I something just wanna... real mean about suck. Right, Dude. T. I don't want to be. What is your <laughs> handicap? Um, well, I haven't. It's it's a little up in the air right now, but it's about a it's about a twenty. Okay. I, yeah, see, I, I guess Lurch is right because I don't think game. you suck. I agree. That's not I don't think you to your suck. Game, dude. Your scoring average. Yeah, I guess we, we're <laughs> yeah, hiding a lot of it because range, he's breaking like, ninety. Right. That's yeah. the thing. It's yeah, yeah. I'm thinking you're not of a guys, twenty. Like when you go roll, go through the roll of decks. When you're like, when you say it, like objectively, like. And I've got a couple buddies where I'm like, yeah, man, that guy, like, he sucks at golf. Like, I told one of my friends, love him, Stearns, I played a round of golf with him. I said it was the worst round of golf I've ever seen in my life. Mm-hmm. And I honestly think it and was. And that's how he plays all the time, though. Like, he <laughs> I know. Sucks. I know. And he's actively, he sucks He's horrific. <laughs> he's horrific. Yeah. And he loves, like, he plays golf. He's just horrific at it. I love right, Stearns. So. He's the nicest guy in the world, but he's horrific golfer. And I like, but I do see think- that's a different type though. The, the oh, inability sure, to improve is different. Mean. And I don't mean. even know. I, you know, this it sounds like a nice guy, but I didn't even think that exists. Like normally it's- when you do something, you get better. Like I'm getting better because I'm practicing and I'm playing. Like if I were like, imagine if I did breaking 100 and I played however many times I did that first time around and it just never got better. That's then it's, then what is it? Unathletic? I don't know what it is. Yeah, like, I mean, I got, you can suck at something that you try a lot at. It doesn't mean that you're going to be right. good at it. You're that, allowed totally. to suck at things. Just because you attempt a lot of stuff doesn't mean you're going to be good at it. You can still continuously just suck. I feel like there's I always s- a little bit of improvement. There could be improvement oh. from horrific to suck, yeah. My, like, I, in the other way, I felt like – I was looking at my gin app the other day, and the best I ever got was like two years ago was a 7.9. And like that to me, I was a I was a good golfer at that point because I was averaging a lot of like 82s, 83s, 85s, 84s. Now I feel like I'm an average golfer. I've totally taken a step back because I'm av- averaging 91s, 90, 89. I cannot consider that to be the same good as 7.9. I'm a 10 now. So like I consider that to be a big difference. Sure, I'm improving now, but I'm not a good golfer. I'm an average golfer that plays a lot. So like I think there's a there's allowed to be that gap. I mean, just because you're trying yeah. a lot doesn't mean you're just like in the next category. I'm playing right. a ton. I just can't get there. I just there's something going on. I don't know. Yeah, I I mean I'm looking now. My good my good friend Mike from back home, 
He's an 18.2 index, but I wouldn't say he sucks. He's actually a match play nightmare because he gets a lot of strokes and he can like, you know, he pops a decent amount. He's kind of a threat out there. He's athletic. He's got pretty good touch. He can make putts, but like his ceiling clearly isn't particularly high because he plays, he grinds, he's a member of a club. He's a legitimate 18.2, but he wins matches all the time. So I guess I wouldn't say he sucks and i wouldn't say trent trent sucks like, trent you, you hit the ball pretty good you get around you can win matches as well you make a lot of good scores to like crush the other team's soul so i guess like sucks is probably pretty harsh i'm i'm thinking in terms of someone like trying and playing something and not improving it could definitely happen my friend greg was the worst fucking halo player in the world and we played we're three years into it in college playing three hours a night he would go like three and 22 and just be horrible Really good athlete, played college golf, starting goalie on the soccer team in high school, played uh, varsity hockey, really good. Horrific Halo player, just could never figure it out. I think there are, like, our buddy Joe. He's a horrific golfer. It's just what it is. He's He just will always suck, I think, at golf. I don't know that there's, like, a few. <laughs> I'm sorry, Damn. Joe. That's yeah. got nasty I, I, on Joe. That's, I like, you, that's just something I didn't you don't want it hear. to go that route. You don't you don't hear that in like elementary school. They don't say like there's something you're just there's some things you're just gonna fucking suck at no matter how much you try. Dude. But I think that's real. You know, suck at yeah. sex. I, also, like you're you're not having a ton of it. No, you're just like you're you're sucking. You suck at everyone. We all suck at sex. We're not out there like fucking El Nino, whatever his name is. That's fucking pounding people every like you, you can go for an hour. Now I'm really good. Yeah, yeah I, I'm not gonna elaborate on that. You know the guy gets tossed up against the wall. He looked like YP. <laughs> what was his name? I El remember Nino. that guy. Yeah, his name El Nino. <laughs> I don't El Nino know. Poro or something like that. The guy could go for hours. He did not suck. It. He does not suck. I don't know who sex. That is, but... All right, whatever. He's always going in for some sort of lesson with the teacher on videos, and uh, he's always, things. Well, get that's a, a fake scenario. They're not actually trying to teach them anything. Well, he's learning something. I'll tell you that. Someone's getting taught something. Yeah, I want to let you know shared. that I there's a lesson being shared there. I want you all to know that I think that the biggest widest range is average. I would consider Trent yeah. to be now an average golfer. I think he's, Agreed. he's yeah. made leaps and bounds to get into the area. We will suit. I think like when he starts to move on to breaking 90, he'll be on his path to being a good golfer, but that's like, that's a lot to take in. That's a huge leap to get there. But I think, yeah, I think that chart, wherever chart, if you are looking at it visually, I think average might be the biggest one. Yeah. There's also some in my brain that's like, that ticks a little bit, because to Riggs's point is like how well they play to their handicap. Because yeah. golf is so well suited to play match play, the strokes. It's just like it's beautiful that way that anybody can play. And I feel like also I negatively judge somebody based on how well they like consistently play in that range. Because I have other buddies that like I might say, you know, they're pretty good. But, you know, I would like love to play against them because they'll put up a decent score, but they're so erratic that they really kind of suck in many categories because they spray it off the tee and we don't play like the real world rules where if you spray it OB, probably we allow just a lateral or something like that. So they just take them out of play of so many holes that unfairly like a decent player who's like an 11 or a 12 in my brain sucks. <laughs> Is that like think too? about also, think about if you're playing in a match and, <laughs> Such and a mean your buddy's a 19. Think like your buddy's a 19 and you're like a whatever you get. What are you at now, Lurch? Like a four or three? Like, I actually I mean, played you, some three? great golf. Yeah, I, I jumped down to like a four one. I shot. All right, so you're giving that guy who's a 19 like 14 or 15 strokes. And yeah. like it's not even mattering because he's hitting balls OB. He's topping shit. At the end of the day, you're like, this dude fucking blows. And he knows it. He knows it. We all, he does. Like he knows it. I, he knows it. I mean, I think I teeter on suck all the time. It's like no. I'm closer to the suck than I am the good. And like, so you just have to be real about it. And honestly, what I learned today, we had Scott Fawcett here and for uh, episode two, like you have to just like be told the truth sometimes. And I was told the truth today all the time. It's like, it doesn't help you to, get to sugarcoat your game ever. Like, oh, yeah, it was like, that was okay. Like, you're playing all right. Like, no, like, actually, that was a horrific shot. Worse. Let's let's try and actually fix that. Or else you're just going to continuously do the wrong thing and the wrong thing and the wrong thing. Had Scott Fawcett been like, yeah, that, like, 15-yard fade is perfect. No, Like, you got it on the green. We wouldn't have spent an hour on the on the range afterwards 
trying to get rid of that and like hit my shots closer to my targets. And like, now I'm getting closer to good as opposed to just being average and just hitting all these like weak ass fades to the left of greens. He could have lied to me easily, but instead we fucking figured it out and we got a solution. You got to be truthful. You do. You need honest feedback to the proof. Yeah. But suck at skeet shooting. You know, it just is what it is. I thought I'd get better, fix the eye and everything. I just suck at skeet shooting. We went like a year and a half ago with kids, my brother, my dad, kids, his buddy. I mean, I hit like four out of like 60 the whole fucking day. I suck at it. You caught a huge ricochet shot in episode two of Fixing Frankie. One that it got moans and groans from the people behind the camera, but it had to be said. I mean, we were talking eye alignment. And like how important it is. And I just, you know, I, one plus one equals two at this point. You just had to That's do okay. it. That's yeah. Okay. I don't mind. No, it's okay. We were just, you know, the, the, li- the line of the eyes has to go up to the pin. And I, yeah, you know where that was going. Yeah. <laughs> to, you know, got to chuckle out of the people. It is what funny. It is. It's funny. It's fine. It's I, funny. I get it. You yeah. know, it's part of the game. I said some mean things. It went on for a long time. <laughs> no. Sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> T, I it's a good a scale. It's you. a good scale, honestly. I don't know. When someone gives you, like, when you're improving, because this used to frustrate me, do you appreciate, because somebody's like, oh, like, not bad, or like, okay, even though, like, by all intents and purposes, like, you advanced it, but it, you didn't really hit a great shot. Does that piss you off when people say, like, things like that, even though they're trying to be nice? You know what I'm saying? Like, you line up for a shot, and you kind of miss one a little bit to the right, but, like, somebody says, like, pretty good. Because... I'm sure your standards of yourself are higher than like what you're getting out of your golf game right now. You know what I mean? You know where I'm kind of yeah. going with that? Does that piss no, you I off? No, I know what you mean. No? no, it definitely doesn't piss me off. Like I, cause I think everybody knows what's going on always. And like, even that's just like, they're just trying to be nice, which is fine. But like, we all like, if they were, if they just genuinely were like, Oh, that's pretty good. And they're saying it like, usually you're fucking terrible. Like that's, that's usually not the sentiment. Usually it's just like, they're just saying it because it's better than silence, which I'm fine with. Silence makes people uncomfortable. Like you hit a bad shot and then there's silence. It's not so bad, but if somebody just goes, nah, you'll be all right over there. That's okay. Like, I don't, I don't No, That doesn't make me mad at all. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. It does. It's cause it's definitely a fine line. You know what I mean? Like when, People are trying to be nice, and you're like, dude, well, I really wanted to hit that on the effing green right there, um, or whatever the case may be. So I just kind of like, you know, when everybody goes through it and it's like improving, it's it's definitely a fine line of how you feel about like the sentiment coming back sometimes. Yeah, I don't I don't think too much about it, to be honest. Um, well, I'm excited to put all this into practice. We have three big golf trips this year. We have Scotland, uh, we have Big Cedar Lodge, and then we also have Myrtle Beach, boys and girls, play golf Myrtle Beach. We talk a lot about it. It's the golf capital of the world. Myrtle Beach is a spot that you've been going to for a long time, I feel like, Lurks. You've been doing a boys' trip down there, right? I have. Uh, yeah, we did a – right out of school, we did a buddy's trip there with eight guys and it grew to 12. We played all sorts of co- courses down there. Um, but, yeah, I've said this before. It's just like a playpen for adults. It's really – somebody actually – I was playing golf this weekend, just referred to, like, golf courses and, like – men's golf or like golf trips as guys i don't want to like you know i want to be careful of my words there but a fun golf trip is uh just right. honestly like an amusement park where you're like oh mom can i go play over there can i do this can i do that and you just get to do it all day long and have beers and just hang out and then they've got you know some good steakhouses there so yeah myrtle beach is an exceptional place to go so yeah. you think yeah. going on a boys trip is kind of similar to asking your mom if you could go around different places at an amusement park well no like hmm I'm really, we had a couple beers when we were there, so I'm trying to remember the analogy of, because he really tied it together in kind of a beautiful it's knot. Weird. It's like, man, this is such a sick boy shirt. Reminds me when I used to ask my mommy if I can go on the Superman ride. <laughs> what no, the fuck, dude? Like, you're what? like, as a parent, that you're like, yeah, you can up, do you this, weirdo. you can do this. Yeah, I don't, you know, I would love to know the analogy right now, but who? Maybe it'd be like if you, I'd love if you were topic, at an amusement you know? park, like, <laughs> without I know we can't, but I have no idea how we tied it together. What? It's okay. Myrtle Beach. Myrtle Beach. You guys you guys good to talk about play golf Myrtle Beach? Can we do that? I love play golf Myrtle Beach. Uh sure they're a huge I. sponsor of the Barstool Classic. I love stepping up to a tee at the Play Golf Myrtle Beach hole and seeing that little signage they have that's made out of the sand. It's just everything about Myrtle Beach just makes you feel like you're on vacation. It's a vacation spot. We all live in places that you live in, and then Myrtle Beach is the place that you get away from it all. 
you go there, you golf, you drink, you have fun. And then you go back home. It's like, it's, it's that memory spot. You know, you make memories there and you cherish all those memories. And that's just, that like, Myrtle an Beach is, park. just like an amusement right. park. Uh, well, you could pick a golf course and plan a trip. It could be very difficult. Luckily, the golf nuts from Golf Trek can help you. They got more than 100 years of golf experience. They booked more than 1 million rounds in Myrtle Beach alone. They feature a team of golf nuts who will get you exclusive rates for Myrtle Beach courses and make sure you and your buddies have the trip of a lifetime, just like asking your mom to go ride a ride at an amusement park. Visit MyrtleBeachGolfWeekend.com and chat live with a golf nut who will help you plan your trip to the golf capital of the world. That is MyrtleBeachGolfWeekend.com. You get to chat uh, live, do a little live chat. It's nice, nice feature. It's a good time. Michelle Wee West, retiring from the LPGA Tour. She's only 32 years old. If you recall, she was obviously one of the great phenoms really in golf over the last like 30 years, the way that she came up, the Nike endorsement. She was unbelievably young uh, when she played in the LPGA Tour for the first time. When she played in a PGA Tour event, she was still really young in like her mid-teens, I believe. Uh, ultimately, she had a couple good comments. She said, the U.S. Women's Open means everything to me. Uh, it was the one tournament I wanted to win ever since I started playing golf. If I hadn't won the 2014 U.S. Open, I definitely wouldn't retire and I would still be out here playing and chasing that win. So it speaks a lot, too, to the fact that this is the biggest tournament of the year for them. They're at Pine Needles, the women, U.S. Women's Open. Um, it's definitely a little different, I feel like, than the men's circuit where you know, I think they kind of hold all four majors pretty close. Uh, maybe some hold the Masters a little higher, especially the U.S. guys. Maybe some hold the, the Open Championship higher if you're international or if you're European. Um, but generally, I feel like they're held pretty closely. In the women's game, it feels like the U.S. Women's Open is the Super Bowl of of their circuit that's just kind of the way it seems to me and michelle we west saying that i think kind of reiterates that point for sure one of the great names of the game um you know and it's just different like I, she's we actually listened to her talk at um where were we in san francisco what we were at that? the olympic club um, right here the Olympic Club. Yeah. She got interviewed uh, in front of everybody that was there for media day. It was really interesting. Kira Dixon was there. Kira Dixon was there. Just interesting to talk to her, to, to listen to her talk about like how she, um, you know, has to maneuver her way around like being a mother and like wanting to do all those things, and then also having to compete at the highest level on the LPGA tour against these people who are dedicated twenty four seven to try and win championships and all that stuff. So obviously an early retirement when you compare it to other sports or other athletes and stuff, but you can totally tell why. And, you know, she's just a legend of the game. Michelle, we is a name that will go down. It's just a legend of the LPGA tour. When you heard it, you're just like assassin, you know, it's like, you don't want to compare like to tiger woods. Cause it's like this, you know, stack up, but like, she was like that big, bigger name that when she showed up, you're like, Oh, I'll turn that on for sure. When was the last time she played like a consistent schedule? I don't even remember. It's been a while. I looked through the article. She only played like a handful of events, I feel like, last year because she kind of returned last year. Right. Uh, only played like a handful of events. You know, she's a mother now and married, so clearly, she, you know, she speaks a lot about how her priorities change. They asked her about, you know, how she feels competing this week. She was like, yeah, you know, not great. <laughs> I don't really practice like I should. And, right. You know, I'm a mother and whatever. Um, so yeah, she hasn't really played a consistent schedule in a while. She faced a lot of injuries, clearly the putting situation. She was doing the table, uh, the tabletop putting, uh, which I think she was doing when she won the U S women's open, which is amazing. But Pinehurst area, pine needles is like eight minutes away from Pinehurst where she won the U S women's open. So pretty cool kind of whole thing for her. So, um, shout out to Michelle. We West. She's unbelievably nice. She's been on this show. She went on token CEO with Erica. Um, always been really nice to us. She, Trent, you like ran into her a bunch of like randomly for a couple <laughs> yeah. of years, right? Yeah. I haven't seen her in a while, but there was a stretch <laughs> where I would just run into her very like, and we didn't know each other. Like we, I, you and I Riggs, we went to like a rooftop a few years ago and we met her with how um, better. I think we were with. Yes, that's right. And we met her. And then I continued to see Michelle Wee here and there, like around New York City, but not like that rooftop wasn't to the point where I thought she would remember me. And she definitely did not, because at some point she w I was walking a dog and she was petting said dog and she definitely didn't recognize me. So I just kept it moving. And then I saw her at a Starbucks and then I just kept seeing her all over the place. But it's been a while now. It was kind of a weird party that we went to. Remember, like wasn't our scene at all. 
I felt very uncomfortable. I remember. It was yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, it was like rooftop, and people were like, it, it, "What's that place? The Standard? Is that what that place is called? With that rooftop up there, like in midtown?" It was a nice place. Yeah, really. There was nice an Olympic place. diver up there or something. Yeah, and it was just it was a weird crowd, like Diving? just different. Yeah. An yeah, Olympic like diver? A, is that a thing? Know, that the, the gold medal. Oh, was like, the Olympic diver diving? Like into no, when I met him, watching? no. They were hang, hanging oh, out. Okay. The way you mentioned, like, I was <laughs> picturing, like, Cirque du Soleil. Michelle, we wasn't out. swinging a golf club up there. I don't know. <laughs> no, but the way, I don't know, but the, you were like, it's a weird, it was a weird vibe up there. Really nice place. There was a professional diver, and to me, I'm like, all right, that's fucking crazy shit going on up there. <laughs> it might as well have been. It just was – yeah, it just wasn't really our – It was one of those scenarios, and it's actually funny because uh, Feidelberg just tweeted this out, how um, he gets uncomfortable every time he comes across – he's filling out paperwork, and it says occupation on it, and he's just like, ah, I don't know, like – content creator podcaster blogger like what do you what do you put and i felt that way at that rooftop because people are like oh i'm an olympic diver oh i'm michelle we what do you do and it's like oh man mm. i work in media i guess yeah I don't know. I try, like, you try to church it up a little bit but people are still like this dude's fucking nobody we were like we filmed each other like hitting shots in times square during a blizzard the other day and that you're yeah uh, yeah we're losers As like security's we're gonna, taking us out they're like it's we're gonna leave here. Yeah, it's like it was I a weird get, scene. Can I get a Bud Light? And they're like, "What? what? Like we don't." It was just weird. It was kind of a weird scene, but they're super nice, <laughs> anyway. So Michelle Wee West, uh, great, great. She said that I accomplished two things I wanted to accomplish in life: graduated from Stanford, won the U.S. Open. So congratulations to her. Good luck to her, obviously this week. And I'm pumped to follow along the U.S. Women's Open, Pine Needles, great golf course. Um, Chris Goderup, your boy, Lurch's boy. Lurch has been playing golf with this guy at Rumson Country Club. I feel like for years telling tales of him hitting it like 350 way by you. And he just won the Fred Haskins award for the most outstanding NCAA D one male collegiate player for the 2021, 2022 season. I mean, he won the, he's the MVP of college golf. Yeah. He's, I mean, he's exceptional. The kid is phenomenal. Oh, I actually started to know his dad pretty, pretty well. We played what last weekend. Uh, his dad's actually, Won the Jersey four ball with my buddy Chuck Antonin. Please so gosh. they're studs. One time um, we need something of substance from Lurch. He just cuts out. Well, if you know in the, the podcast police. world, Frankie, it's actually, you know, the audio is recorded locally. Um, <laughs> 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 he didn't like that. <laughs> um, but anyways, uh, the guy's a stud. Oh. His family is a bunch of studs. I think his sister is going to Navy for lacrosse. So they're just a family of athletes. But. Um, I think uh, the OU coach said that he's the best driver of the golf ball in college uh, golf like history, honestly. So uh, hard this for us to respond nice to that. It is really frustrating that I'm frozen <laughs> right now and I keep going in and out. But anyways, uh, Oklahoma State uh, coach or Oklahoma um, coach was saying that he's the best driver of the golf ball in like college golf history. So I can still see Trent's face moving. So I know that I'm still good here. Um, but yeah, I'm pumped and, to see what he does going forward. They've got the national championship. I think there's eight teams left uh, for the team um, for the team final. So uh, pumped to see what they can do because their team's pretty stacked with he, Logan McAllister, and a few others. Incredibly impressive too that he won the MVP this year and also had an unreal year last year. Did he not? Was he number one or two last year? He was first team All Big Ten. He was All American, so he was in the mix, but um, didn't garner like the type of year that he had this year. I don't. I don't think Rutgers and I do not know much about college golf, but plays in like the same arena uh, as Oklahoma. Um, so I think that this was like a big step up in just like the events that he played. He's got a. Um, he's he's in the John Deere. I think he's in a few other events as well. Um, so he's going to turn pro here. Um, Super frozen. And I'm potentially oh, wow. that's, even that's being an interesting one field. too. So he's got a pretty good yeah. summer ahead. Uh, am I correct? I know that? nothing about Chris Goddard because you just keep cutting out. I, I, but, I've heard nothing about him, but I know but the I people that are listening at home know. They know. Did, uh, am I correct in that when we did the official four play college rankings, that he was our number one? Yes. Months ago? Yes. When we were in uh, California? Yeah, so. we nailed that. I mean, okay. So we're one for one on that. We'll do that every year. Pretty easy. Pretty easy. Yeah. Game. Got her. Yeah. He's a Jersey guy. Saying, Rumson? Is he a Rumson guy? 
Rumson guy. And then what I was saying that I was hoping Trent would hear is that uh, he's in the John Deere classic field. Oh, beautiful. Hell yeah. yeah. We love that. Thank you. I'm glad I'm glad to hear that now. That's very exciting. Also, this is such a this is a stunning one because anyone I don't know whenever Lurch says something, you take it with a grain of salt because of like you just don't know. He doesn't really know. Frankie's the god on his truth. Yeah, exactly. He doesn't really know our world, so it's like I got this guy. It'd be great for the podcast. Like, all right, dude, what is he like? Some fucking like drone guy? I don't know. He's a good guy that Lurch probably had a beer with, and he like had a four hour conversation at the bar with. And he would always talk about this Chris Goddard guy. And you're just like, who the fuck is this guy? We're not putting your friend on the show. Like I'm thinking my, that to myself. And wouldn't you know it? He's the greatest fucking golfer <laughs> in the country. He's, he's, he is, dude, Danny Rappaport's tweeting about him saying, good God, what this guy does to the ball. Like he said, pray for golf balls. I can't imagine you two together playing with the way you both compress the golf ball. I mean, I'm not even close to his, I mean, like, he literally puts it up maybe a hundred yards further than me off the tee. And then every club I would say is 30 to 40 yards longer. It feels like, I mean, like it's not even in the same wavelength of what he does to a golf ball. They just, they fly and they go for honestly forever. Like Chris Goddard could win multiple majors with the talent he has, right? He's that type of tour player. Or is, is it not? Yeah, it's crazy to, to say. I mean, you, as soon as you win the, this award, like you're like, if you go down the list, it's, there's some elite, elite golfers, so yes. It just feels crazy to say that. But Can we sign yeah. him? Should we sign him, Lurch? Let's sign him. I mean, we've talked about it for a long time. Let's sign well, him. We would have gotten Chris. him like three years ago when they were fucking going to Rumson Deli together. You, you said you were going to follow up. Yeah. We're going to yeah, sign him. It's like, yeah, yeah, Lurch. We'll like talk to your friend tomorrow. I don't uh, know. Like, that's what, that's what it was three years ago. We didn't fucking know what the hell's going on. The price went up. You should have smacked us across the face and been like, you see what's going on over here? This guy's going to win the fucking, fucking Masters. guy's unbelievable. He's the, he's the best player in college I'll golf. I'll say, Lurch did not – you played it cool. Like, you're buddies with the guy, and you're like, this guy's unbelievable. But, like, we would hear about it once every couple months. This guy's the best golfer in the country. That's, like – that's – that's as good he's as it gets. You know that, right? He's number one. Like we just did this whole rating That's well said, Frankie. Sucks. Yeah. Average. Good. And then I said unbelievable. Then I said the best. He's the best. Also, uh, this is going to be really uh, an ironic segment for everyone listening because it looks like Oklahoma uh, lost to Arizona State, and it looks like Chris Goddard up lost seven and five to Preston Summerhays in his one-on-one -on -one match. Which is a shame. You know that that's a shame. It's a that's one, just the worst that, news ever. That's a horrible, horrible, <laughs> horrible news. stat. But you know, <laughs> golf. So you know, you can't you can't base the it's guy a funky on one game. match. It's a funky game. That kid Preston Summerhays is supposed to be an unbelievable golfer as well. Really? You got anybody um, else on your radar? That's like a that's a that's a freshman or a sophomore. Well, you got to have the national champ out of Wake. Whoever won that kid, uh, that's supposed to be phenomenal. I don't know his name. Uh, I would love to be able to. That's the guy that's right boys now. with the whole Nashville crew, right? No, different guy. Oh. He's not the guy that plays with Nate Bargassi? No, different guy. We got to fucking dial oh, this stuff in, me. boys. Lurch, we'll you just, might have yeah. to be, you might have, you, we might just send you around and you will be our college golf recruiter. College golf guy? Yeah. I kind of love that. Where we you just go out. and you, you find talent and then we put them into our timeline. We throw a couple Barstool logos on them and we become the, be the best golf stable in America. Also, I heard you guys had a great chat with Corey Kisper. Great. Yeah, another another one of your boys. <laughs> had a couple beers with that guy. Great guy. Really a good guy. We actually gave you yeah. a bunch of love there. We were like, Lurch is the ultimate get a beer with guy, which is true. Yeah. Appreciate Loves to get a beer. Yeah, just perfect to just get a beer with. It's like Might be a jolly, problem. friendly, yeah, loves talk about beers. anything. Just, you know, a lot of eye contact. So much eye contact. What did Jake Bass just say? Looking down on his phone. I'm Gordon Sargent. Fucking video to... I had to post something by 4.30 and we just like are in the middle of a show. Uh, the Vandy kid. That His name was Gordon, Gordon Sargent. Sargent. True freshman. That wasn't him, unfortunately. That's just... No way that I was love great. it. I love no, Jake No, I think Fire that's the guy that him. won the national championship who was a freshman. Oh, gotcha. But he was not the guy. I want to say that kid's name was like Austin. What was his name that plays with? That, he was a Vanderbilt guy too, that kid? I think so, yeah. Hmm. We got to brush Oof. up on our college golf. But anyways, Chris Goddard up. 
Stud. Off to the stars. We'll get him on the show Absolute here, Lurk. Stud. See if we can get that. Be a yeah. good get. See if you can book. I would him. love to do a day in the life with him, and he's open to it, like pre John Deere, and just getting ready for that because he played in the Puerto Rican Open, was finished, I think, T six in the Puerto Rican Open. Um, so he's got the belief that he can do it, and I think the kid's like kind of a quiet gamer. Um, so I'm pretty excited to follow along and see how it goes. I think he's got his best buddy on the bag, so they'll work together. Was he, at Rutgers and, years. was he at Rutgers and then redshirted to Oklahoma? Yeah, he was at Rutgers, redshirted to Oklahoma. But, okay. uh, yeah, he qualified for a few corn, terry, uh, corn ferry corn events terry last four. year. Yeah, you know, it's been uh, a long day. Let's long talk about summer. swim trunks. Let's talk about Peter Millar's swim trunks. Now that summer is here, it's time to get ready for days spent by the water. Lord, you're a big beach guy. I'm going to get my swim trunks real quick. Talk about swim trunks and how awesome Peter Millar is. Also, uh, I'm wearing this Peter Millar item that we got right here. Uh, before we get to swim trunks, we put the B cross T logo on okay. Peter Millar gear. And then also this crew neck right here that Mr. Borelli was sporting. He looked like a trillion oh, yeah. dollars in this thing. <laughs> yeah. Holy yeah. cow. We were at Del Vino Winery here on Long Island, and we were walking by uh, a fountain, just an absolute regal-looking fountain. And he's like, take a photo of me here. And it was just – it was a photo shoot, and then we went to the car and got the the water cooler that the the, the little thermos that we're selling. But yeah, Peter Millar is actually the one of the only things I'll wear that go above the kneecap. Um, I went on a bachelor party. We had a couple of these bathing suits, and let me tell you, they're comfortable. They are comfortable. If you're trying to let the breeze hit your lower half, it's a good piece of clothing. Peter Millar just figured out the way to just make clothes really comfortable and really classy and the best. No matter what they make, I mean, they, I'll, if they made a male G-string, I'd wear it. I don't, like, I don't care what they make. I'll, I'll wear anything with the Peter Millar logo on it. At this, you ever point. worn a G-string? You ever worn a G-string? I've never worn a G-string, but if Peter Millar made one, I'd make it. I'd wear it. Yeah. Oof. Uh, That's a strong claim. Do you get, do you get in the pool this weekend, Frank? You show off those legs and nice trunks. I, uh, I wore shorts, but I didn't get wet. I didn't get wet. <laughs> okay. I left that. I for got the wet quickly. Yeah, it was nice. Got uh, the ocean this weekend. A couple riders. Good weekend. Peter Millar swim trunks. That's nice. Peter Millar swim trunks feature incredible four-way stretch and quick drying fabric, all with cool custom prints. True. Hand designed in their Raleigh, North Carolina studio. You can go to petermillar.com slash foreplay to shop all their swim trunks and use code foreplay for complimentary shipping. That's petermillar.com slash foreplay. Shop all their swim trunks. Use the code foreplay. We're going to get you complimentary shipping. Check out a bunch of our favorites outside of the swim trunks there as well. And use uh, complimentary shipping. Uh, I have a, I have a book recommendation for everyone. Oh, as do I. Oh, we got oh, book recs. Look at that. Dude, I do have a coming. book rec. Well, is it I'm a book f- you've read that I'm currently reading? Okay. I'm currently reading uh, the cup they couldn't lose: America, the Ryder Cup, and the Long Road to Whistling Straits by Shane Ryan. This was a Kirk Minahan recommendation. He raves about this one. There's a lot of golf books going on with Alan Shipnucks, um, Bob Harrigs. The Shane Ryan book came out, I think, May 10th. It is phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. It essentially, in really long form, just describes that I could not possibly have been more wrong about the Ryder Cup, but that a lot of people thought and believed that, you know, the 25 years entrenched of bad habits for the U.S. team – that a lot of that was masked by Steve Stricker and how quiet he is, but that actually he was like the perfect captain for the perfect time for the United States. And then it goes way back into the history of the Ryder Cup, how it almost became discontinued because of money, because lack of interest, it wasn't on TV, how originally like the fans in Europe were the first fans that actually started like heckling and being aggressive against the American players. And then the next two, two years later, when they came back to America in like the 80s, that since it wasn't televised, none of the American fans knew that the American players had had to go through the trenches against you know the fans out there. So when the Americans came home two years later, all bitter after losing, that like all the Americans fans were just clapping for everyone because that's what they were used to at golf tournaments. And the American players were like, what the fuck? And then eventually got to the point in 91, the war by the shore down at Kiowa, uh, where the American fans finally turned and were like, oh, no, no, we're going to bring the heat. And it gets into Tony Jacklin and all the history. It's fucking phenomenal. So a high recommendation, high recommendation uh, is the cup they couldn't lose. It's Shane Ryan's book on the Ryder Cup. It's excellent. Okay. Frankie? 
this would been this book has been recommended to me time and time again it's called project hail mary it's written by andy weir who wrote the martian it is an outrageously good first chapter to be honest like it just i'm a huge space guy i'm a huge like conspiracy theory guy I, I'm not a big conspiracy theorist. I like to look into them and see if I'm going to believe in them. But I, I'm a, I enjoy just like, all right, like how did the world start? And like, what's going on out there? Are there aliens? Did the aliens make the pyramids? All that bullshit. This is about going to another planet. It's called Project Hail Mary. And just the way it's just, the, all the descriptions that are used about like, you just feel like you're there. It's this guy ripping, he wakes up and he ripping up all these cords off of him. And he doesn't know where he's at. And this robot's keeping him on this fucking platform. It feels like the beginning of an outrageously good movie. The Martian's like one of the best movies I've seen in a long time. And the fact that he wrote that and he's writing this, this will end up being a movie. I wanted to find something that will end up turning into like a major motion picture because I kind of, I've never done it the other way around. You know what I mean? Like I've never read the book and then watched the movie. Yeah. With Harry Potter, I watched all the movies, fell in love with them, went back and read books. So I want to be able to experience books that. You excellent. guys kind of talked me into that of like, because with this, it's not history. So I feel like, I, like, all right, like I like to read about history and I like to learn it. But this, like I can actually formulate my own storyline. I feel like of like what guys look like and like where they are and what the setting is. I know you already told me all this stuff, but it's been fun. No. You like, that's fiction. You like fiction. I love fiction. I like to be able to do that. And then I also want to see like how wrong they get the movie. Cause I'm like a narcissist and I'm wrong about everything. And I'm crazy. I like that. You're already building up. Like I got to prepare for an argument for when this book gets turned into a movie. I can say what I thought it was going to be. And then they fucked it up. Big time. Love it. Whatever you can read. I'm in. I'll have very, very strong takes on what these people are supposed to look like. I'm going to read this. (laughs) I'm going to read it. The Martian. It's called Project Hail Mary. The Project Hail Mary. Mm -hmm. Who's it by? Do you know? Andy Weir. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. A couple book wrecks there. I like that. Uh huh. I've actually got that Bob Herrick book. Riggs, you and I talked about it um, when we were at the PGA Championship and we had just uh, read the Alan Shipnuck book about Phil. So I ordered that Bob Herrick book. I'm I'm working on a book right now. I'm not worried. I'm reading it. Then once I get finished with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna read that Bob Herrick book. Sounds yeah, we're good. Gonna have, we're gonna have Bob on. He does a book kind of going uh, congruently almost with Phil and Tiger and their dichotomy, their relationship to one another, their careers. Uh, you've got it right there. Trent Ryan has it right there. Thank uh, you, Amazon. Bob actually reached out and was like, you know, uh, if you don't have the book, I'd love for you to check it out. And then I said, you know, let's get you on the show. We we're gonna do it around PGA Championship, but things were hectic and uh, we had Tiger Woods, you know interactions ourselves that kind of dominated the whole week if you don't recall that but we're gonna have bob on too and see that book so all kinds of books fucking we're a reading we're a reading podcast now i got two things to say as i know we're getting to the interviews number one the wilbur monday before the u.s open buy your tickets special guests special events the whole thing we're going to be making it as good as we can possibly can it's going to be awesome number two this Friday, tomorrow, right? Tomorrow, if you're on Long Island, I will be at the PGA Superstore, PGA Tour Superstore in Westbury, New York, on Long Island. It's centrally located on the island. If you're out here from one o'clock till four o'clock, we're making it a day at the PGA Superstore. My dad's going to be there. We're selling Borelli stuff. We're giving away free pizzas to everyone that buys something inside the PGA Superstore. You go in, you get you get a piece of merchandise for Father's Day. We're going to have all the new Father's Day merch in there at the PGA Superstore. You come out, you're going to get a wooden, a wood-fired brand new oven in our pizza truck. My dad's going to be cranking them out with my cousin, Steven. We're going to be just rolling pizzas all day. They come out so good. They come out crispy. They come out like Sally's, real thin crust and, and just so, 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 so good. We got that going on. So 1 to 4 p.m., putting contest to get Borelli's gift cards, the whole thing. Come stop by. It's going to be amazing. We're giving away free one bite head covers also just for coming. It's honestly, the PJ Superstore is like heaven on earth for golfers. You got to go see it. You got to go try out all the stuff inside there. I saw there. Steph Curry. I think Steph Curry was walking out of a PJ Superstore uh, today after getting his clubs regripped. 
And then, you you know. gotta go. They've got everything, and all of our merch is there, plus stuff that you've never would see on our website. Our website has so much good stuff, but PJ Superstar somehow gets stuff that we've never seen. Yeah, they've got these like water um, thermos, and the, the, these water bottles are insane with the B cross T and the drawings on them. So yeah. I'll be there Friday. And then I guess the third thing is like the fucking Rangers are going to Eastern Conference Finals and they're playing the Tampa Bay Lightning, a team that the Islanders have gotten eliminated from the Eastern Conference Finals two years in a row. For me, worst day of my life last night. I did make $5,000 on the game. So that's one thing. Mm. I, I ended up clearing six grand you on bet? that series alone. Oh, I bet them. Frank, you I, the Marshall I, Sportsbook. I, I bet them. I bet them to win this. Yeah, I bet them to win games three and four, oh and gosh. they did. And uh, yeah, I got a lot of money back, and that is what it is. It sucks. I would have rather blow, like burnt it to the ground that money, and we'll see if they beat the Lightning. I might not be around anymore, but I mean, I it's been a fun ride to everyone. Last night I went live. You know, a thousand people watched me sit on my couch. And I just kind of like stared out into the distance. There was a bad angle of me that I have to get ahead of. So good. It's the worst thing that's ever happened to me, aside from the Rangers making it to the East Conference Finals a year after the Islanders made it the last two years. It's as fat as I've ever looked. I don't know how it happened. I knew it happened. I knew Credit it to happened. Me. A few somebody, times now. I mean, somebody DM'd no, that to me, and I chose bad. I chose not to post it. But after the new revelation with the eye ricochet shot, I might have to change my tune. Well, yeah, last night was people were fucking tweeting it like crazy. I knew right away because I was on my phone on StreamYard, and it's and StreamYard is the only way to. Oh, dude, it was worse than that, dude. It, I was laying down at an angle, and it was it's you know when you open up your Snapchat yeah, or your phone or whatever, oh, it's yeah. as it's literally every person's nightmare. Getting on the internet to two hundred and fifty thousand people is bad, and I hit end. I had you can tell the whole video. I have it angled up. I hit end and went. Oh, okay, that's it. Oh man. I went and look at that face, dude. Look your, how much your fat face is, is in a puddle of chin. It's just, <laughs> yeah, it <does. laughs> it's just resting in like icing. Um, I I uh, I saw it and then I hit end and then another thing popped up. Like, are you sure? And once I saw the, are you sure? I knew the last ten seconds had been live. I almost started fucking panic. I tried to, I almost deleted the street, the stream. And I knew Tommy uh, smokes got it already. Subscriptions, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, everyone out there. How many subscription services are you paying for each month? Do you even know, you know, who's going to help you with that? True bill. Yep. True Simple bill. That. Best company that you could possibly have for managing your money, your, subscri your subscriptions, things that you have no idea you're paying for, for years. It just that, alerts you immediately. Truebill helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions so you don't need, want, or simply forgot about all that stuff that you forgot about that you don't want, that you don't need, that you signed up for, that you wish you didn't, you don't even know that you signed up for, you don't even know that you're still paying for it. You cancel subscriptions directly through the app. On average, people that use Truebill save up to 70, I'm sorry, $720 a year. $720 a year you save on average people that use Truebill, variety of tools to help customers improve their finances. You create a monthly budget and expenses, track, evaluate savings, goals, automated savings. You choose how much to put away weekly, get push notifications when you are getting close to going over your budget or when your cash is running low. We all put this in, put it on our phones, use the app synced up our finances to this puppy months ago, and we obviously have been raving about it. It really is awesome. Told me how much I spent at Chipotle, canceled a <laughs> bunch of subscriptions, which is nice. That stuff's just out. I don't see it on my statement. I don't see it coming through the credit card anymore. Out. They're just gone. Subscriptions you don't want, gone. Don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash four. Go right now, Truebill.com slash four. It could save you thousands a year. What do you want to say? I know. No, I like Trent's tweets always. There was another fat photo of you that came out, and Trent's move was just to uh, quote retweet and just say, please delete, which is just an, Get it off really the internet. Yeah, yeah, Frankie's my there. guy. Frankie's my yeah. guy. Get it off of there. I don't what do you want, want to say about the Rangers, Lurch? This is your time to shine. No, it's, I mean, it's epic. The run they're on is epic. They're getting better every day. Shesterkin is so goddamn good at the game of hockey. It's really hard to believe how good of a goalie he is. I love watching him play. He makes just a split save with his left leg when they're up 2-0. And if they score that goal, the whole game's changed. 
Um, yeah, they got some. They got some real grit. They got some real sandpaper. They're playing well. We'll see. Lin, uh, Ryan Lindgren's like an absolute stud back there. Just a gamer. Lightning are going to be a tough task. Uh, they're they're a good good squad. We'll see how we go, but I'm looking forward to it. It's just nice that the Rangers are playing after Memorial Day weekend. There's nothing better in the world than watching your team play playoff hockey. It is it's fucking so awesome. goddamn fun. It's amazing. You I'm your, jealous. Like I'm so jealous. Oh my god, dude! Your family gets together. You get friends coming out of the WeWork because you got your like two friends. Are flying. Got, like oh my, it's the fucking goddamn best. And then last night. We were sitting around, there was like six of us, and brother's got a great setup with a little kind of like uh, you know, like an outside fireplace goes up. Do you have a flag? Do you have it. a Rangers flag? <laughs> yeah, he's got a Rangers flag. You haven't seen it. It's uh, We're planting it. Um, and um, so anyways, like we were like, when should we talk about like that we can start talking freely that we're going to win this hockey game? And so we decided with five minutes left, we were just going to talk about how great it was that we won the game and the series because we were up by four and things were just hunky-dory. Um, so, yeah, we'll see how it goes. We got the – it's crazy, the turnaround, though. We're playing freaking lightning tomorrow. It's like I'd love to have another day of rest for the boys. but They've just been waiting, too. Is. They've been waiting. They got – their quivers are full of arrows. Their swords are sharp. They've been standing there at the edge of that fucking top of that hill just waiting for the Rangers to come – limping through it i will say i've been wrong i was we there was a moment when the rangers were down three games to one i believe the pittsburgh penguins when we laughed on this show about how bad they were how they didn't even deserve to be in the playoffs yep. and they have gone on a tear since then i've been wrong every night when they were down two nothing last night or up to nothing last night i hammered the canes put like 750 bucks on it at like plus 400 and i was and they lost six to two and just got steamrolled so i'm the opposite of frankie and then i'm not even able to hedge it i'm just losing i have no belief in the rangers whatsoever i think they stink and they just keep winning and they're in they're one of they're in the final four it's fucking well amazing. the goalie they, I, I don't want to sound bitter the, and goalie, they, better and the better. goalie they brought in last night is he still alive oh. carolina who the hell is that guy <laughs> i mean every shot went Third right server. through yeah. who the fuck was that guy so this is it's tough that's the third that's the second third stringer or third is that the second third stringer they played in a row in the playoffs so well, every so, starting goalie that they faced has not played the series. They, yeah. Um, now they're playing. He the best made an goalie unreal in the last save. Forty-five uh, years. He made like one of the best saves ever to start, and then they just gave up another two-on-one, and Strom buried it low corner, which was a bad goal to give up. Um, but the Rangers are a force, man. I mean, sorry, Frank. Like they're just like playing some goddamn. They're good winning. Hockey. I wouldn't say they're a force. They're winning. They're getting brought to like Game Seven against triple back so, goalies, back to back series. They're down. Well, they in lost every single a series. brutal game, Game One. They I'm lost just an saying, awful like, Game One, and they've given up some weird goals against in that Pittsburgh series. That like, if they can solidify the house a little bit, I don't, I don't see it like as a far cry that they beat the Tampa Bay Lightning. And then my brother and I were talking that if they play the Oilers. We're flying to Edmonton for the cup, and we're just going to be out there for a game because be awesome. that's like the mecca of hockey. It'd be great. Fly out to a four play event once in a while, but you're going to fly to Edmonton. The second thing is going to be I just <laughs> don't understand. Weekend. I just don't understand how they continuously have these stretches of just playing the most outrageously easy. Like it's, it's, it's such an easy route to Eastern Conference Finals because of. You don't have to play the best goalie that they, the team had. You're playing the triple backup in the first series. You're playing the double backup and then the triple backup in game seven. And now you're playing Andre Vasilevsky, who is probably the best goalie of my lifetime. There's no doubt about it. What he's done in the last There's three years. Unbeatable. He's phenomenal, but best goalie of your lifetime? Of my lifetime? Has to, I mean, I don't know. Last, all right. So last, know, just... Would you say he's the Serious best goalie in the last 20 years? I wouldn't. I would say he's, a, but like I wouldn't say for sure. I mean, I think Dominic Hasek was probably the best goalie that I've ever seen. He was the most okay. fun to watch because he just. I mean, he was. Dude, Vasilevsky's won the back to back cups. He might, he might win three cups in a row, and he's making it look outrageously easy. I, well, at some I, point, I, I know we're in the middle of it. As good as that Lightning team is, as good as a hockey team that I think you can put together, especially with cap. I mean, like. If Ryan McDonough's your like two pairing with Headman, it's like it's insane how deep and strong they are. 
Um, I do agree. I think the Rangers could maybe catch these guys. The Islanders pushed them to seven games last year. It's like if you play that type of style hockey, you can kind of minimize their big guys. They are super deep, but like you got Braden Point, Kucherov, Stamkos. It's fucking the list goes on and on. But right. you play tight hockey in the playoffs, like things just happen. I don't know how it's happening. It just happens. I wish they didn't get to this point. I wish the fucking Hurricanes, they didn't go one for 25 on the power play during the fucking series. It's like the most pathetic series I've ever seen a team ever do on the power play. And then they were giving up shorthanded goals. They were fucking giving up fucking power play goals like crazy. They couldn't fuck. I mean, the Rangers score on every power play they get. Every single one. They went up 2 nothing last night because they just had two power plays in that a row. First, that goal by Zabinajad to Kreider back. I was just... Not a guy I mean, that was Kreider. poetry in motion Crazy. how good that was. That was just such good hockey. It made me... I'm bitter. Jump out of my seat with joy. Um, I have to be But yeah, bitter. we'll, we'll see how it goes. How, do, how many games did the Lightning play in round one? Because the Rangers have now played like 14 games. Seven. Few Remember they barely beat uh, Toronto. They, sh- they really shouldn't oh, even have won. Of course. Dude, there That's were all right. those pretty sketchy calls in game six that Toronto was rattled about. Frankie's boy, Tavares, right. was rattled about. And then it came down to the wire in game seven. I think they won, what, in OT in game seven to advance and then just steamrolled Florida. And sorry, Lurks, yeah. but I have to shout out our guys at Tampa. That's I awesome. Mean, totally. We got this Barstool Golf hat right now, and I think every player that Frankie just mentioned has signed this hat. My I dude. fucking hate Tampa. I know I know John <laughs> Cooper. My dude, John Cooper, my guy. But we got Kaloran, Pat Maroon on here, Kucherov, Stammer, McDonough, the captain. On a Barstool uh, golf hat. And he was insane. a Ranger guy. He hung out with us on a Barstool golf hat, which I like. So, I, you know, I look, it's hard for me not to root for Tampa when they do stuff like this and we have connections. But our guy, uh, Devon Tays in Colorado, uh, McJesus is maybe the most fun player to watch of any sport in the world. And we never really is that tonight. Him. West, that's tonight. Yeah. And then we got Rangers, which like Madison Square Garden for Stanley Cup final and Lurch. And his dad's one of the oldest season ticket holders and his dad's an angel. So it's like hard to root against that. So there's I, being pulled in a lot of directions at this point without my squad in it. But Stanley Cup finals, a pretty fucking good final four for the for the NHL. They got to be they got to be jacked up. I think Rangers are plus 500 now to win the cup. They're they're the they're. The odds out there, the least favorite Biggest to win. dogs. Yeah. Biggest dogs. Couldn't come up with that term. Um, um, the series gonna, versus Tampa, I think they're only plus 190 in the I'm series. I'm going to have to put the money tighter on plus than 500. I thought. I'm going to have to. to I'm going to have to roll plus 500. This, you got to view this as a business transaction. Just, I'll probably go 2K on them plus 500 for a nice $10,000 payout if yeah. they win the cup. Maybe even more. I might go I might go 3K because I'm, I'm already in the fucking – I'm in the money 6K right now on this run. Like, do I go $5,000 at f- plus 500 to win 25 grand if the Rangers win the cup? It's half a pool in the backyard. I mean, what are we talking about here? I could put a pool in the backyard if the Rangers win the cup. So no, what do I, I do? I think there's, I a way you can, for- there's a way you can do it where you will, like take some of it. And this is me. I'm a, I'm, I'm a conservative thinker when it comes to gambling. Take a little bit, put a little bit on. You don't need to be putting 5,000 on plus 500. Then it's just like, it's over. You don't understand how good it's going to feel if they lose, though. That I won't even think about that money I just won. You know, it's all just been a grind. I started with a $50 bet. Let's, that's the biggest part. Whew. I started this run, game one of the playoffs against the Penguins, with a $50 bet on the Rangers. And I just kept going and going and going. Do you only and- bet if they're in elimination games? I bet them every work? single game. And then I got lucky where sometimes I could not bet them because I was not in a gambling state. And then I was like, I just didn't bet them. And then they, they, would, they would lose. So I saved on a lot of nights where like I would have lost like 500, 600 bucks when I was doubling down, tripling down. It, it would, every time I hit big, I would like, take it down a notch. So like, you know, like I would bet like a thousand bucks on game four. And if they, if they won that game, now I had a thousand more in my account. The next game I'd bet like two fifty or 500. I was always like kind of being smart about it when I thought they might lose. So yeah, I've like been crushing the playoffs this year. I don't Let's know. Let's go Rangers. Fuck the I Rangers. I had Shesterkin to have a uh, shutout last night and it was getting pretty hairy. I don't know if you watched the whole game until he made that play I behind the net and he scored. But I had 500 <laughs> bucks on Shesterkin to have a shutout. That was gonna pay seven grand, and I was beside myself after two periods and playing the way it was. And then I was like, "All right, they got a big lead. Coach has got to be in the locker room. Like, 
this guy's your effing horse. Let's solidify the house, pucks off the glass, high and out, and let's just chip and charge and close this thing out. And then Shesterkin thought he was just a defenseman behind the net, skating around with the puck, playing like body position with a forward, turned it over, they got a goal. Tony D'Angelo of the worst things. Anyways, closing note, last point, John Augustine. That's the guy that we couldn't find earlier. Yeah, that's the name. That's the name. Uh, How about the Oilers avalanche over tonight is at seven. I'm pounding the over. I mean, I'm going to hammer the over goals. on that. I think I'm hammering the over. I mean, come on, baby. Give me some gold with McJesus, McKinnon. The, everybody's going to be flying out there. Do they're, we um, they're, switch the fact the gears that it's McDavid here? Versus, nope. Sorry. The fact that it's, it's McKinnon okay. versus McDavid is fucking insane. Uh, should, they're going to be flying up and down. I'm assuming this game is in Colorado tonight. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Colorado's going to be jumping. Devon Taves, he's one of the best defensemen. His counterpart, uh, Makar, is the, one of the best defensemen Ooh, in the league. They are it's good. It's fucking crazy how good that series is going to be. I just don't trust Mike Smith. I think he's no. a fucking loose cannon in net for Edmonton. And I think it's going to be Colorado pretty easily this series. I think I'd take Colorado in five. I think so, too. Then again, I thought there was no chance Edmonton could beat Calgary. Calgary was so good all year, and here we are. Truly, Boston Beer, speaking of which, Truly Hard Seltzer, a clean, crisp, refreshing hard seltzer with a hint of fruit. There's over 30 flavors, so there's something for everyone. What was Nade Shots? Hibiscus is his favorite. He was Um, going on and on and on and on and on about the hibiscus. Strawberry hibiscus? I believe it was strawberry hibiscus. Yeah, I believe it was strawberry hibiscus. Guy loves it. Trulyhardseltzer.com. You can find Truly near you. All cans have under 110 calories, one gram of sugar, naturally gluten-free. Um, title spots of the Barstool Classic for four years running. Everyone that shows up to the tournament, including Barry Enright, who shot uh, 60. Everybody who shows up to the tournament has a great time. They drink Truly's outside. Maybe it's 105 in Arizona. It's 98 up in New York. Have yourself a refreshing Truly Hard Seltzer. They got over 30 flavors. They got a little bit for everybody. Uh, I'm going to have a bunch this weekend. It's going to be delicious. It's going to be less than 110 calories per can. Gram of sugar, it's great. So find Truly Hard Seltzer. You go to trulyhardseltzer.com. Check it out. They present from the gallery. We're going to hammer out a couple from the galleries real quick. Everybody gives a shit for never getting to it. We're about to get to it. Um, Max says, what are the chances the boss man tees it up at the U.S. Open? I think it's pretty low. Mm. I think it's pretty low. I'd love to know how the recovery went the week after the PGA Championship. Um I'm going to say it's pretty low. The only – I kind of instinctually agree. The only reason I I might have some optimism is because the weather. It should be hot as balls. It's not – we're not in May anymore where it could be a little dicey. It got cold over the weekend. I mean, if it's hot, if it's 80s, 90s in Boston, which is usually a pretty humid place, you know, that really helps helps our guy with his joints and his back and his leg and all that. But uh, overall, I think it's pretty low. I mean, I – I've played uh, the country club Brookline where they're having the U S open this year, played the member guests for like three or four years in a row. So I played the course a bunch. It's a hilly classic new England topography type golf course. It's not great for him. Wa- it's not great for him walking to be honest with you. Uh, so I would say 20% maybe that's my guess. Hope I'm wrong. Yeah. And we know how bad he wants. He's going to play in the open. So just more recovery time, just no need to fuck yourself up at the U S open on a very hilly course. I, yeah, I see – There's, I mean, there's obviously upside because it's another chance to win a major, but I th- I don't think the upside is is really there for him to do it. Yeah, it feels like a miss. It feels like he's not playing in this one, um, which is sad to say. I Obviously, everybody wants him to play, but I think it's close to 5 10%. His, I mean, him walking away and those post-pressers were just – he was not trusting the body to get through I'm, four rounds of golf in competitive actually, way. I'm going to go higher than I – I'm going to go 40%. I think there's a – I think there's decent – because, look, the motherfucker's not going to play again until the Masters after the Open Championship, right? So, he might as well – I mean, I feel like he might be like, all right, Doc, it's been a week, two weeks now since the PGA. Did I hurt anything? No. If Hopefully, if the answer to that's no, then he's like, I might as well try to fucking play the US Open. And if it's the same deal, I'll just withdraw and I'll get ready for – um, the British Open. So I'm going to go 40%. I still think it's, you know, clearly unlikely, but I'm going to go 40%. Connor says, what percentage of brand new golf balls get lost on the very first shot? Ooh. What percentage of new golf balls get lost on the very first shot? I think only like 15%. Oh, because you have to be playing it. 
Really? Pretty high. Right. I was gonna say five percent, and that's insane. That's an insane amount of lost golf balls across the world. It's one in every twenty. Yeah, just gets lost. Imagine like five. the golf ball industry knows that. You think about balls they have to sell, and they have percentages like five percent of something would be insane. When you're talking billions yeah, of balls, true. I wonder what imagine they're get like covered. What percentage get recovered though? Like imagine that they're lost sitting. Ball. Imagine they're sitting around a table and they're like, "All right, boys, like we're gonna make these fucking we're gonna make these fucking balls," and five percent of these things are gonna be gone. Off the first swing of every single person that buys it. Do you think be like, holy shit, we're turning over golf balls like motherfuckers. Do you think you uh, be playing a- big golf ball manufacturers have ever lobbied golf courses to make them tighter? <sighs> no, they don't have to, man. They- <laughs> no, like, hey, put a bunch of water in on the first tee shot so we just recoup a bunch of these things. Have a small drain at the bottom of the pond that just spits we, back out. To the, the tighter field. the golf course, the more hazards, the more golf balls it. you're going to sell. If I'm if I'm big golf ball and I'm not lobbying golf courses to get tighter, then they're they're not doing their jobs. It's just I, good business. We it's went to business. Taylor Made and we had a, um, a meeting with them, and I, a lot of the a lot of the meeting was like the future of Taylor Made, and they wanted to kind of like pick our brain of like what they thought that we what we thought would be like a cool product for the future because they're just they're the best company of all time, and they want to hear from regular people, regular golfers of what we thought is the best thing that can come out. And one of the things I asked about was tracking devices on balls and just the technology is just not there yet. Right. Like, and I genuinely don't think it has anything to do with like golf companies don't want to not sell. It's not like golf companies don't want to put a tracker in the ball because they feel like they're going to sell less. I just think that the technology for getting a tracker inside a ball, it does not meet their standards on what the ball flight and all that stuff in the spin should do. Like they were saying, it's like, it's just not there yet. Like at some point it might be, but I was like, we were driving in a golf cart yesterday playing golf and like, it's, it shows you where your cart is. It has all these geometric tags, the geo tags that you can't go into the high fescue. And it's like, imagine the ball is just fucking on that screen and you're just driving up and it's just like, just show me where that ball is. Especially when you're playing New England with all the leaves and whatnot, it's kind of a shocker that there's no such thing yet. You there know, is such a thing. To... It's just you can't like mass produce them to the level and quality that like like why, like I said, why can't you put it in a TP5? And they're like, because then it's not a TP5. You just we right. haven't gotten yeah. to that point yet where you can put a chip inside this ball. This every single every single ounce of a golf ball is accounted for to the fucking paint, can't you... the amount of paint that goes on it. So you can't just put like an electronic chip inside and have it right. do all the same things. I guess. Couldn't you, here comes a guy talking, doesn't know what he's talking about. If you, the materials that are made with a golf ball, couldn't you have like, you make one of those parts trackable. Like if, depending on what it's made of and you're not, you're not tracking a chip, you're tracking a, a material that is inside the ball. So let's like a say, rubber tracker. I don't know if they have that. Okay. You walk around with one of those beepers looking for right. it. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. You kind of have to be one of those weirdos on the beach who has a metal detector, but yeah, like yeah. you, you, you go you, near the driving range, you explode. Just, <laughs> so just track it. <laughs> but that would, cause I understand what they're saying where it's tough to put something inside a golf ball because all that room is spoken for. That's just technology and everything that they put into that. But if you just take what's already in there and somehow track that, that would be the same thing. So there you go. I hope the R and D department is listening to that. I'm sure they're hanging yeah. on every word. Mm-hmm. Um, Mitch says, how is Lurch doing with his hundred pushups per day? Yeah, that stopped. So that was uh, just like everything in this show where we, we go through spurts. That was uh, probably lasted, I would say, a little over two weeks. Oh, Felt wow. good. So I did them for a little bit. And then, uh, yeah, just one day just didn't do it. And I'll tell you what, <laughs> when you don't keep sliding down and doing the job, it really fades away quickly. So that's done. Um, we had a good run. Maybe we'll try to bring that back. But that is done for the time being. Are you currently on any plan or commitment or uh you know i know you do crazy cleanses occasionally and things of that nature i had one of the worst health fiascos of all time this past weekend Mm -hmm. i we cooked some hamburgers and they were burnt and so we ate the hamburgers because but because they didn't taste good my brother and i just decided to feast on friends had bought probably like six to eight pizzas for a big group but really like they accounted for like, you know, girls and they usually don't eat as much. So there was just like 
four and a half pizzas just left over. <laughs> and I went to absolute town. I mean, not a dairy guy. So it's I a guy that eat can't dairy. eat cheese. Yeah. This is <laughs> right. a guy that can't eat. So I, <laughs> I think I probably had after the burger, I don't know, six to eight slices. And then they had these caramel desserts, man, again, just covered in butter. And they're like the size of a brownie, but they're like caramel with chocolate. And then they're covered in almost like white chocolate with a little bit more caramel glaze. And oh, I must have had, I, I, I kept yeah, grabbing I was... the biggest one on the plate. So, you know, cause I keep my number down, but I get the biggest size. You know what I'm saying? Cause sometimes oh, yeah. you're small. You're a little cups, mental game you of... play with yourself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Trent's locked in. Look at him. He just oh, moved yeah, up on. in his seat. Bite sized like, candy bars. I can eat 15,000 of those. That's not, uh, that's better <laughs> yeah. than one candy Staring bar. Staring at a quicks and I just ran through over here. So, uh, I had like four of those, woke up the next morning, could not breathe. Gave the old, you know, Huck and Loogies that Frankie oh. could not stand. Oh, yeah. And ha- <laughs> yeah, there it is. <laughs> had to play a tennis match the next day. It was like nearly puking. Um, so, that's anyways, yeah, on no health kick at all. I don't know what my weight is, but filling out the pants in just a horrible way. A very funny part of that story that you just you whipped right by was you ate the burgers that were burnt. And the reason you ate more was because they didn't taste good. It's not like most people when they eat, they eat and they're like, I'm full. I can't eat anymore. Most I mean, you factor in taste at a certain point. But for the most part, when you eat something, even if it's something that's like, oh, that burger was okay. I'm full now. I don't have to eat again. You're just like, it didn't taste good. So now I'm going to eat seven slices of pizza. Yeah, it had that burnt aftertaste, which is kind of just lingers. And I had to get rid oh, of that. And I thought the, the only way to get rid of that, exactly. You could have tried it like a great. glass of water, maybe. But you went with uh, nine pizza slices. And I love dessert. that burnt taste. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're also part alien, honestly. You say that, just and I agree with you when you say that. But when I had bacon at your house a couple weeks ago, that was good bacon. Like I, th- But it was super crispy. It just wasn't it, burnt. But no, it wasn't burnt. But do you usually like it burnt? I do. I like the edges burnt. I like like, I like it to go from black to then brown. Cause that bacon that you made, that was great bacon. And if that's how you like bacon, then that's how I like bacon. But I guess I always got the impression that you liked it had to be just blackened. Well, I like to tell the restaurant leave it on so long that. You're going to need to call the fire department because they'll never get it to that point. They'll get it closer to what I made for you. If I scare them with how dark I want it to be. If I just let them just do regular restaurant bacon, it's going to come out wrapping around your finger. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because sometimes it's lazy. They're quick. They just like to throw it on, throw it off. I want it to be like, no, this thing's got to fucking break when I look at it. Okay. That makes sense. I have a question about sushi. What's the difference between a hand roll and a roll? Oh, big difference. Found this out. Huge difference. What is it though? Hand roll, at least the place that we, like Riggs and I used to order from, would come in almost like a snow cone. It was massive. And so it's a sushi roll that's like almost the size of your fist, but it looks like a snow cone. I'm looking right now. We're doing this show. I'm ordering from this Rick, sushi you spot by my that house. Before we yeah, go you, to the next topic, okay. gives you a roll prep preparation. Choose your roll preparation: hand roll or roll. Hand roll. So I, actually, I love the hand roll. I would give it a shot. No, the hand roll. It is kind of a uh, almost like a taco uh, sushi Ow. roll, but the actual roll, yeah, it's one of those. I think just roll is a normal, you know, set of six yes. or whatever. But I mess that okay. up many times where I'm all jacked up pop open the lid and it's like, what the fuck am, is this ice cream? Like, what am I looking at? Right. I love it. You don't want to, they're good, but it's not what you, it's not what I want. If they're speaking not of sushi, speaking of sushi, we got to give a shout out when we were out in oh. San Diego, Trent. All right. So last time we went to San Diego, we were there um, with the full swing guys. Oh, this wasn't even, this was the first time we met the full swing guys, full swing launch monitors. We fucking love them. By the way, Barstool 300 is the code you want to use to get $300 off your full swing launch monitors. We freaking love these guys. The greatest bunch of people that have ever started a golf company. It's crazy. They're just the nicest guys of all time. Daughters, Jason, They're the whole great. crew. Um, they take took us when we went to the, uh, the farmers, they took us to... Um, this Ken place sushi. called Ken Sushi. 
workshop. It's in the middle of a strip mall in San Diego. And was it Carlsbad or La Jolla, right? It's like right by Torrey Pines. I think it's in La Jolla. It's right. Sure. Yeah, right there. Um, and anyway, a very unassuming place. You sit outside in these like domes type things. You know, those like those igloos. And um, what they do is they go and they'll say, all right, Ken, who's the sushi chef, and he's just the owner of this place, and an absolute fucking legend, will just bring out what he wants to bring out. So you have no idea what he wants to bring out that night. And it's just constant amount of food and all these ridiculously good displays where they're smoking it and then they lift up the glass and it goes in your face. When I tell you that I thought it was the greatest meal I've ever had, and I honestly thought I was over-exaggerating. So we took Trent there. Again, the full swing guys took us out, the whole crew, Brendan. We had Jake there. Mancini. Um, We had Mancini. It was just such a good crew of just like everyone that wanted to have really good sushi. We hyped it up so much. And you know, when you get a little nervous taking someone to a spot like that, where you're like, oh, I hope they have the same experience as we did. It was even better this time. And I watched Trent from the other side of the table, smiling and giggling all night long, getting his paws on some of that sashimi and some of that like perfectly cooked salmon rolls and and the uh, Wagyu beef on top of the roll. It was just, it never ended. And you ate for hours. And you had good food and good wine. And I, Trent, you have to explain a little, I mean, from your side, was I over-exaggerating with it being the greatest sushi meal you've ever had? No, it really was. And that guy, Ken, is an artist. He just, the food is, it's art. And like, I've had, I didn't eat sushi until I first moved to New York City, which was five and a half, six years ago. I just, Smitty, you know, see, Smitty ordered us some sushi one time. It was delicious. Yeah. And then I just went on a sushi kick. That was crazy. I didn't, you know, Cedar Rapids not really known for its sushi. So I didn't, didn't indulge while I was there. So when I moved to New York, I was like, I'm going to try sushi and I loved it. And, and the sushi I've gotten around New York city, I've loved. It's really good. It's just, it's really unlike any, any other type of food. So when we're talking about sushi and Frankie's talking about Ken sushi and how good it is and how we got to try it when we go to San Diego, I was just like, to me, sushi is sushi. I don't have like a huge, you know, I don't, I don't know a ton about it, but every time I've had sushi, it's been great. The sushi at Ken Sushi is just like 15 levels higher than the sushi I have wow. in New York City or 15. anywhere. Dude, it's, it's, it really wow. is. It's just a completely, it's a full experience. And I, I really love the places where you go and you're just like, you know better than I do. So you guys just bring out what you think we'll like. And they just brought it out and they kept bringing it out. And they tell you, you know, eat this one with soy sauce. Don't eat this one with soy sauce. Here's how you want to eat it. And it's, it's fantastic. It's a fantastic. The, the truffle roll. The truffle roll. Outrageous. And I don't, we, I don't eat, we ate so much. Truffle. We ate so much. I don't even remember all of it, but I know that all of it was delicious. And it is a very unassuming place. You're, it's in a strip mall. So you're just like, oh, I don't know. Frankie's talking about it and I think it's going to be a standalone restaurant and it's going to be this crazy looking place. It's not, but the food is outrageous and it was so good and you didn't overhype it at all. It, it lived up to that expectation and every time we're in San Diego, we got to go there. Oh yeah. And like, and Ken comes out and he picks his one guy last time. It was me. He thought I was Justin Thomas. And this time he came out and picked Justin because Justin Mancini, our guy behind the scenes, books all our travel. He's just the absolute man. He must. He said something to Ken. Uh, Ken came out. And he's like, how is everything? He's bowing to us. He's just such a fucking legend. He's so nice, so cool. And then he just picked Justin to just rip shots with. Like, he, he goes in front of Justin, puts what, – what was it? Was it like sake. Te- it was sake he put in front. He just slammed a bottle of sake in front of Justin, put two shot glasses in front of him. He gave one to Justin, gave one to himself, and just cheersed him and just drank it and then went back into the kitchen. And it kept happening and yeah. happening and happening until Justin's like, I can't even see straight at this point. This is fucking crazy. Like, he just put, picked me to have the night of my life. So, yeah, shout out to Jason from Full Swing. I mean, it was just the best night of all time. I just had to I had to get that out there because I've been thinking about it like crazy and I'm having sushi right now. Just it's just not going to be the same. It's It's good sushi. You can you can just drill sushi rolls. Lurch, when they said don't use the soy sauce, you knew you were in for something fucking crazy because you're like, if you're telling me not to douse this thing in some sort of flavor, it must have the most flavor already. At one point I said, I was like, do I throw soy sauce in this? And the guy left. He goes, no, not this one. I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. And some of them you could. And they had the, um, what is it, wasabi, which I, I love. Yeah. Frankie probably doesn't dabble. Ginger. But yeah, yeah. I just, Dude. you put the wasabi in the soy and you're just, now yeah, we're just. you make soup out of it. 
We're you just, just screw that around. Dude, Jason from soy. Full Swing did that. He took a little bit of, of wasabi yeah. and he threw it in the soy sauce. And then as he was talking, was just kind of maneuvering it around the soy sauce. And I'm like, you're creating a little bit of paste there almost. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's a little bit of a paste. It's the best. It's the only way to eat sushi. But saying no to soy is crazy because then I don't even I don't even know where to start. It's like I want to douse that thing. You no. flip it over once, you turn it over on its head, and you just cover it in soy. And then you learn you got to flip it upside water. down. You have to get the actual fish in the soy sauce. You don't want to get the rice in because the rice, like, it sucks it all in and ruins the flavor. You know what I mean? The rice needs to be just like yeah, the so base. That's tough. It is tough. You got to learn. It's tough. Anyways. I only had oh, a couple yeah. miscues with the uh, with the chopsticks. I was a little nervous about that. I know how to use chopsticks, but, again, I haven't been eating sushi all that long. But I, I felt comfortable after a while. Good. All right. Uh, ready to get to interviews. We got a couple of great interviews. Taylor, Rachel, uh, we're going to throw it to them. First, we got to talk about Shopify, which is the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. Trent and myself started this four-play brand. Just the two of us, Robbie, uh, Robbie Fox, Octagon Bob was there. Um, clearly grown into something quite special. Added all the fellas here. Uh, Shopify, okay, in terms of entrepreneurship, that was a little bit entrepreneurial of us. Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big business. So upstart startups, established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. Shopify offers online retailers a suite of services, including payments, marketing, shipping, and customer engagement tools. Connect with your customers, drive sales, manage your day-to-day. You go to shopify.com slash four, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial. No-brainer, free 14-day trial. Might as well. And get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash four right now. That's shopify.com slash four four for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. It is interview time. We'll be back next week on Tuesday. Hit it hard. Hit it hard. Hit it hard. Hit it hard, go Rangers. All right, folks, we're joined right now by a very special guest. Uh, Stanford women's golf, been a phenomenal two years. NCAA individual champion last year. Now you guys are team champions. We're just talking about class. What's, I mean, what's life like for you right now, you guys are champs. You got summer break coming up. Are you just kind of riding on cloud a million right now? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was on cloud a million for sure last week. Probably still am a little bit. I definitely am. I'm just reality sitting a little bit. I got a lot of assignments due. We're not done with school yet. But last week was just nothing less than a dream come true. That's what we wanted all year, and I can't believe we got it. That was crazy for me because we were talking about that pre-show that you're still finishing up classes. You guys are on a quarter system. I mean, with uh, with everything, with uh, conference, regionals, uh, nationals. How does that work with class? Are you? I mean, you're Stanford. Are your your professor? Everybody's cool with it. Do you have to come back after beating somebody in a grueling you know match at Greyhawk and like email your professor? How does that work? Yes. Yeah. We communicate with our professors beforehand, but they're always so cool with it. They're super supportive. Stanford's a really supportive environment. So they're always good with us missing, but it's not always the most fun to come back after a round and have assignments due, especially at nationals because every other school for the most part was done and we all have papers due. I had a 12 page paper due on the last day of stroke play. So everyone else is going out and like sitting by the pool after, but we're going to grind. Um, wow. That is just so different. That's, that's, I mean, that's Stanford. That's next level. What, um, so what are you, what are you studying? How, you know, how, how seriously are you taking school? Are you like, Hey, I'm really good at golf and, and schools it's cool. Or are you pretty locked into both? <laughs> I feel like you're pretty locked into both. I'm honestly pretty locked into both. I really enjoy my studies. I'm a political science major and it's something I'm really passionate about. It's cool. I get to have Dr. Condoleezza Rice as my advisor. And in the same age, I so relevant. So I actually really enjoy it. I mean, sometimes when I, you know, things do, I'm just absolutely done with it. But if you take a step back overall, I'm really interested in it. I feel like you got a lot of, um, you got a lot of worlds kind of colliding. You got kind of Lisa Rice is tied in with Stanford, with school, with women's golf. You're playing in the, you know, you've played the Augusta National Women's Amateur. I feel like you just got a lot of things kind of colliding all the time and your world's crossing. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of crazy how that works out. Dr. Rice is just incredible. I mean, as my advisor, as a supporter of Stanford Women's Golf, as a 
human being. So it's cool to have people like that who, you know, are involved in every aspect of my life and, you know, know what it's like to be student athlete and can see all the different things that we're doing and can help with that. So we'll talk a little golf. Obviously, you know, I mentioned at the top, but, um, you know, you guys are been uh, one of the better teams if not the best team in the country, pretty much your entire time. You're a sophomore for both years. Last year, team-wise, didn't finish the way that you guys wanted. This year, it did. Were you more nervous this year, uh, you know, winning and, and battling it out until the very end in the team, you know, match play? Or were you more, more nervous last year trying to close out the individual stroke play? It's got to be the team. Um, the individual obviously felt great such a huge honor and you know one of the goals I really wanted to accomplish but the team win is that ultimate goal and we were so excited but also we were so nervous I mean I've never you know when the every single when every match and when the semifinals ended coach and I started crying after the finals we were all crying I've never cried about a golf tour like I've never cried about a win it's like we were joking like okay you go home your parents are proud of you and call it a day but this is this is cool this is about so much more than yourself you're playing for the girls in front of you and behind you so it's huge college sports are just awesome i mean the camaraderie the the lingo the the fact that it's t- in golf especially i mean you know, for most people watching golf, you get uh, Ryder Cup or Solheim Cup. You get it very rarely that you really get to observe team golf. And you guys are playing team golf week in and week out. Is it, I mean, how, how I guess how different is it for you? Because it hasn't been, you know, I feel like it's it's not really team golf through junior golf and all that. And then you get to college. Yeah, it is in high school, but still you're probably pretty focused individually on, you know, I mean, you're playing in U.S. Opens for Christ's sake. So you're probably pretty focused on individual individualistically when you get to college I mean how cool is it to have that difference as a golfer where all of a sudden you're part of a team it's the absolute best and that's why I can never imagine leaving early like it's so cool the rest of your career you can go try yourself week after week and play for yourself but this is about so much more than that you get to be on the team week after week with literally your best friends of the world I mean I don't think it gets any better than that I'm heartbroken that I've finished two years of it only have two more like I mean it's it's the best it's so cool yeah in high school golf and in amateur golf you do have some occasional opportunities to play as a team like you know, the Curtis Cup or Arnold Palmer Cup, Junior Ryder Cup, Junior Sloan Cup. And those opportunities are so coveted. Everybody wants those spots so bad because it is so special to play as a team. So when you get to college and you have your built-in team, your girls that are there with you every single day, when we're, you're all fighting for the same goal, it just doesn't get better than that. Uh, do you get more nervous, you know, when you've finished out a match and then you're going and watching some of your teammates try to close out and they've got a big putt? I imagine you get more nervous for that than you do over your own shots. Oh my gosh. Yes. I, cause when you, we all say that when you're playing, you know, you're pretty focused on your match. You're either in control, whatever, but watching someone else take a putt, you have no idea what's going to happen. I mean, you trust them and I'll, I'll take that back a little bit because when you're watching Rose, a putt, you're really not too worried about it. <laughs> if I, like watching you're in a good 17, place. We were, yeah. We were all like a little bit more concerned about like where we were going to run onto the green, like rather than, Oh, is Rose going to make it? Like, so we're <laughs> that's pretty relaxing. That's pretty but, confident right there. That's pretty confident, yeah. which I mean, also, clearly you should have been. Yeah, exactly. And also you care so much more about your teammates feelings because they could never let you down. But as a person, if you mess up, you feel like you let your team down. So you just, you know, you don't wish that feeling upon anyone. You want your teammates to have that big moment where everyone storms the green. So it's nerve wracking on so many levels. It's so cool. I mean, yeah, it is. You know, I mean, we're just weekend golfers, clearly. But when we get a buddy's Ryder Cup or something like that, it is always way more nerve wracking when somebody like me, you're out of the hole, you're in your pocket, and your partner has like a big five footer to tie it. And you're like, please, man, please make right. this because I just please, can't do anything for the love about of God. it. <laughs> I know. Um, so NIL, you are, uh, I believe, the first NIL Nike golf athlete. You kind of followed in some footsteps with Michelle Wee West, with Tiger Woods of, you know, Stanford golfers who become Nike uh, golf athletes. What, um, wh- how did the whole NIL situation play out for you? Did it, you know, did it make things complicated? Because you're balancing school, as we've talked about, trying to play the best golf that you can. Now, all of a sudden, you're kind of balancing you know, your, your 
career from a financial standpoint? Um, how complicated does that get? Yeah, I remember, you know, last summer when NIL was just announced and it was getting started and no one knew what to expect. And it's still super early on. I'm sure it's going to continue to evolve. But I had a lot of conversations with my family and my coach about what we wanted it to look like. And one key moment I had um, dinner with Mark Steinberg and Kevin Hopkins you know, with Excel, who I'm signed with now. And I just really liked their perspective on it because their take was that NIL is awesome and it's super cool and it's going to give you a lot of opportunities, hopefully, but it shouldn't take away from your focus as a student and as an athlete. So those come first and our job is to manage all the business side of it and just bring you opportunities. You can take them, you can reject them, uh, but your focus is on being a student athlete and they have held so true to that. They make my life super easy, you know, relatively. <laughs> they, get, they get the logistics stuff. They just, they ask me what I want, what kind of opportunities I want. They bring me cool, cool deals and I, you know, say yes or no. And then they handle the business side of it. So, you know, they've just been so great in that respect, just getting me partnerships that align with my own values and, you know, are just going to be so beneficial down the road. How sweet is it when just a bunch of swag shows up? It's so cool. I'll never get over it. It's so awesome. Like just to have Nike stuff, have six star, just, you know, send me protein shakes all the time. Like there's honestly you know, a lot less stuff to worry about. I don't have to worry about what I'm wearing or what I'm eating every day now. That's incredible. That's absolutely incredible. Um, so you mentioned earlier, obviously, you know, you, you're not planning on leaving early. You're planning on, you know, doing all four years, Stanford, graduating. Um, what is sort of your desire and plan for professional golf, you played in you know nearly a handful of majors at this point. You've gotten a taste. Um, you know, do you think about it a lot? Are you is it not on your radar yet? What is kind of your desire for the pro golf circuit? Yeah, it's always been the goal ever since you know I think I was four years old and I started playing golf. People would ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I always said a professional golfer. So that's always been the goal, always been the plan, and I'll definitely turn pro after college. Um, Something that's also really important to me is the Air Force. I want to be able to serve in the reserves while playing on the LPGA. So those are probably my two biggest goals. And I don't, honestly don't really have a timeline for how long I want to play or anything like that. I just kind of usually take my life one step at a time. And, you know, if it makes me happy, if it makes me a better person, then I do it. And if it doesn't, then I don't. So, you know, I'll just take things one step at a time. I think that's a damn good perspective. That's an impressive perspective for somebody. <laughs> Thank you. I think you're 21. Is that right? I'm 20. 20. 20 years old. That's an amazing perspective. Air Force, professional golf, NIL, winning national championships, school. It's like you got a lot. I feel like you got a lot on your plate for a 20 year old. I do. It keeps me busy. That's for sure. That's <laughs> good. Um, I got asked about Greyhawk because I live probably five minutes away from Greyhawk. I'm going to go out there this afternoon actually and watch the finals. Um, no I was way. There, oh yeah, I was there on the first tee last week. That was the only time I could really make it. My parents were in town. Um, yeah, on... I saw you from far away, but then you disappeared. So. Yeah, I, I couldn't. St <laughs> we had a bunch of events going on, and I wanted to soak it uh, up because I had I wasn't able to get out there much last year. So I watched the first tee shots. Um, I've hit that first tee shot a million times, and not as successfully as a lot of the ones that I saw. But um, <laughs> it's not an easy one. No, it's not. Uh, thoughts on Greyhawk because they've, you know, I think this is the middle of their three year run that they're going to have hosting mm -hmm. um, championships. You know, I mean, Stanford, you guys are up in um, Northern California. The golf is very different playing desert golf down here. It's hot. It's 100 degrees out. Uh, how do you how do you think it fits? How do you, how do you guys like it? You know, playing clearly you've had success, so I probably can guess. But <laughs> general thoughts on Greyhawk. Honestly, I love Greyhawk. I grew up playing Greyhawk a bunch for the AJGA Thunderbird Invitational. And we were counting sometime before the last round. And I think I've played 28 competitive rounds there. Wow. So it's a course I know and love really well. And I think it sets up really fun for the national championship, especially for match play, because there's a lot of par fives and kind of risk reward you can go for, you can lay up. It's a tough course for sure. They made it a lot tougher for when I was a junior they brought in the fairways they made the greens a lot more firm added some bunkers in there but it's really fun the the weather definitely gets brutal 
after such a long week. <laughs> but if you know how to, you know, maintain your body and drink a lot of water, then it's not too bad. But Greyhawk as a whole, I love. And the people there are awesome. All the locals. I mean, obviously, you're from there. It's super cool. I'm right? local, so thank you. You're very, that's very <laughs> yeah, nice yeah. of you to say that. Really <laughs> but nice. no, everyone comes down and supports. And we've seen a lot of these same locals since we were you know, 13, 14 years old. So it kind of developed like a special place in my heart, a really cool community. I love that. I love to hear that. Yeah, Greyhawk's great. I'm up there a lot, like I said. So um, I get it. I don't know how you guys walk that golf course, you know, this time of year and <laughs> yeah. in 100 degrees. We were, I mean, a big part of the reason I had to take off, I was up there for an hour or so. And my parents were just like, we can't, we just can't do this. It's too hot. It's brutal. It's so bad. You just pound in water or what do you, how do you get through that? Yeah, it's a lot of electrolytes, a lot of water. We try to do a water every three holes um, and then drink a noon tablet, like an electrolyte tablet, a full bottle as soon as you come off the course and then just have more electrolytes and water the rest of the day. Power one as soon as you wake up. Like, oh, it's a lot of water. <laughs> how, um, how much further does the ball go out here for you guys? So much, especially toward the end. I it was probably a combination of it getting firmer and you know you you got more adrenaline at the end. But I mean, I was hitting like on number eight. It's a par three. I had one sixty, and I was like, I'll just hit a smooth eight, and then that went over. And I've never hit my eight iron more than you know <laughs> one fifty. And then on nine, I had one sixty again. So I was like, well, I guess it's a nine, and I hit my nine to like ten feet. And it's just so weird getting adjusted to it because. I mean, it's got to be a combination of everything, but you just, you don't normally hit it that far. So it is a really big adjustment. How much does uh, coaching help out with those kinds of decisions? Because college golf, obviously, it's not like you guys have um, caddies out there, but you can get a little bit of advice. How much does coaching uh, kind of on the par threes especially help you out? Yeah, I was going to say the par threes are really helpful. Whoever goes first is kind of the guinea pig. And that was me a couple of days on number 13. I think it was 150, and I just sent a nine iron over, and I was like, I don't know how I did that. It was a great shot. <laughs> but so then our coach will wait on the tee and go back, tell the players like, Hey, Rachel hit this. Um, she was, you know, say it was 150. She was playing it like it was 145, and she went over. So I uh, we'll end up using a lot of the the same clubs there, and it's really it's really helpful on tee shots too. Uh, the coach might come up to me and tell me that Sadie or someone dropped back and hit a three with here because it's rolling out a lot today. So to have them, I feel like they're everywhere at once. They're always there when I need them. So they're really <laughs> awesome about it. How's your, uh, how's your communication with your teammates during the matches when it's, you know, singles matches, you're clearly not in the same group. Are you guys communicating? You have like signals, hand signals. You're just looking at leaderboards. What's the communication like? Yeah, so I don't necessarily communicate with my teammates about like, any kind of scores while we're out there, but our only job, like coaches, like your teammates shouldn't know if you're up or down in your match, like based off your body language. Like you need to be, when you see them, you're waving back, you're yelling at them, you're supporting them. Like they shouldn't be like, oh, it looks like Rachel's having a tough day out there. Like it's just all positive vibes, all great vibes. And I, I like to know what my teammates are at. So I'll kind of ask my coaches like, hey, like how's it going? Or you can see leaderboards around. And which is super different for me in stroke play, like when it's individual, because I never will look at a leaderboard. I mean, last year's national championship, I had no idea what I was at. I didn't know I had two putt to win by one. No idea. And I don't like to know. But when it comes to team golf, I think it's like really motivating for me to either know, oh, my team's up. They've got my back. I'm doing great. Or they're down and we got to make something happen. So I like to know. And it's just so like heartwarming. It's so special to see, you know, your best friends over there cheering you on from the green in front of you. It's the best. I love that. I love that the nobody should know either way if you're winning or losing. I think that's a really good yeah. thing to take away because, again, I know it's clearly not the same thing, but a lot of people listen and they do a buddy's Ryder Cup trip and, and they're trying to win and they're into match play and you can't be showing that negative body language because it's infectious. It'll seep through. It'll it'll negatively affect people. So just you're hooting and hollering and you're positive the whole time. I love that. Exactly. Yeah, no, for me, I was coming off mono. I was really sick and coach. I don't know how many times she was like don't let them see that you're sick pretend like you're great and i was like okay and like i like some girls were asking me they're like oh so are you still sick i was like nope no nope. i'm great <laughs> i'm thriving so you're telling me when you came down last year with the one stroke lead in the individual ncaa uh stroke play that you play in uh, 18 you had no idea you had a one stroke lead no idea none at all i was 
hoping it'd be more than that, but I didn't want to know. Um, and the coach, you know, I can kind of tell based off her kind of where I'm at. I mean, I had 200 yards to the green and she was like, yep, it's 120 to the layup area. So I kind of figured in my mind <laughs> that I probably need a bar to win or else I would have been a little upset with that coaching strategy. <laughs> but, um, but I mean, I didn't know if it was one shot, if it was five shots. I had no idea. And I'm, I'm glad I didn't know. I mean, when you're just t- trying to two putt a 20 footer, that's easy enough. But when you know you have to two putt to win, it gets a little harder. Yeah, I was, uh, I was, that's why I was really curious. I remember watching that and you had a yardage that clearly you could have gotten there, but there's water all down the right. Everything kicks to the right. It's playing firm. Like you said, you're probably jacked up and excited. Um, so I just assumed cause you just quickly laid up down the left. I was like, Oh, she must know. So I'm, I find that fascinating. You didn't know. I like that. Yeah. That was all coach right there. There you go. I, I always want to go for it. I was like, she was like, okay, what do you have? And I was like, 200. And she's like, what do you have to the layup area? And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I've been overruled. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> um, how cool was the uh, Augusta National Women's Amateur? It's, you know, cl- clearly and, and thankfully there's been a lot of strides made in the last several years for, um, you know, more cool events in women's golf and women's amateur golf, college golf, uh, you know, looking – uh, we're in, in the first year, there was just a phenomenal, um, you know, duel coming down the back nine at Augusta the week before the Masters. And you've got these, you know, um, female amateur golfers all of a sudden hitting all the shots around aiming corner that we've watched for years. So from my vantage point, most people that are like me watching, it seems like the coolest experience in the world for you that's been there a few times now and will be in the future. How awesome is that event? Oh, it is undoubtedly one of the coolest experiences in the world. Um, everyone told me you couldn't appreciate Augusta until you were actually there, and they were so right. Uh, I mean, course-wise, like, the elevation is crazy. The greens are crazy, and it's just so beautiful. It's unreal, and it's so cool to look around and see, you know, my girls on Augusta hitting the shots that we know we can hit but you know the people have only ever seen the guys hit so right. it's so cool you know how many fans come out how much attention that gets just to bring that attention to women's golf the first year I played a a over the ANWA but I was watching it on tv watching Maria and Jennifer come down the stretch and it was one of the coolest things that I've ever seen I've you know played with these girls for years and I was blown away I was like this is awesome you know I'm watching the masters I'm watching masters golf but you know female amateurs it was it's unreal and I mean honestly the pressure those first two days is also like not a whole lot compares to that because everyone wants to play Augusta that day everyone wants to be one of those 30 people so to have made the cut twice is so special and you know after that like you obviously want to play well that last day you want to win but you really are just grateful for the opportunity to walk those 18 holes at Augusta and look around and, you know, picture all the big names you've seen walking up the fairways and you just following in their footsteps. It's very, very fun to watch. I look forward to it um, every year. It's such a good addition. Uh, So for you, I mean, you know, sophomore, uh, right in the heat of your, you know, amateur golf career, you, I imagine, have a packed summer coming up. Yeah, I do. I leave on Saturday for the Curtis Cup and I'm just pumped. That was the coolest experience last year. Nothing, you know, there's no bigger honor to me than representing the red, white, and blue. It's so cool to do it alongside girls I'm so close with. A lot of the same team as coming from last year too, since there was such a short turnaround in between the events because of COVID. So we're pumped about that one. Then I get to go to the Arnold Palmer Cup in Geneva which is going to be amazing. Another opportunity to represent Team USA in Geneva, which is unreal. One of my absolute best friends from Stanford, Caroline Sturz, is from Geneva. So, you know, I'll get to see her have a little Stanford reunion while playing for Team USA. So that's going to be awesome. And then another opportunity to play in a major. I get to play in the Evian Championship. I get to fly right back into Geneva like two weeks later, but it's kind of an awkward timing where I don't, like really have time to stay there but it's also a lot to fly back and like fly back to me two weeks later, but Hey, I'm not, I'm not complaining. It's no, going to no, be no. great. Yeah. It's a good issue to have. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be, it's going to be awesome to learn from the pros. There's so much to learn from them. They're so mature, so experienced. That's going to be awesome. And then women's Am. Um, and I think that wraps up the summer, but it's going to be fun. I mean, I'm stoked about every single event I'm playing. 
Have you um have you played Marion before? I have not. No, I was gonna. Um, they had a practice session a few weeks ago, but I was sick, so I couldn't go. But I'm excited. I mean, I've heard nothing but awesome things about it. I've seen pictures of it. It just seems like a really pure course. Do you do any uh, like? Do you watch any YouTube videos or watch Justin Rose there in the open or anything like that? Or you just kind of show up after looking at a few few photos? I kind of just like Google Curtis Cup and marry it. I'm, I don't know. <laughs> I, I probably should. I've never been one to be able to like sit there and watch things on my phone. I have the attention span of like two minutes. So you can show me a picture, but <laughs> oh, I can't watch a whole lot. <laughs> well, look, I appreciate the time. We all do. It's, um, it's a great perspective. You got a million things going on, which is insanely impressive. And yet still able to perform at a uh, really, really, really high level. So, um, Good luck with everything. Thank you for the time. We'll all be following the career. And, um, and yeah, good luck. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Riggs. Thanks for having me. Merchandise. Merch and dice. Merch, merch, merch. We got a bunch of it. I'm wearing it. Everybody's wearing it. I got these cool water bottles that we talked about already in this show. I got Ain't No Hobby stuff all over the place. I got a Tiger Woods hat. I don't even know if we – uh, sorry, Tiger, Year of the Tiger hat. Is it Year of the Tiger hat? I don't even know <laughs> if we the sell these hat. yet. This thing might not even be on sale yet, but the Whoa. point is that if you go to store.barcelsports.com, you can see what is on sale and you can find a lot of our favorites. It's just the best. This uh, Barstool golf hat that I showed that has all these cool signatures, autographs on it. The That's store cool is hat. insane right now. The selection is it's our own type of superstore where you go from quarter zips to hats to, to bottles, water bottles to pants to shorts i mean everything is just there ain't no hobby merch we've got beanie hats that trent's wearing right now i mean all the new unreal stuff that just got released is ridiculous all the hoodies that we have out specifically the peter millar quarter zip the peter millar um lava wash hoodie lava unreal wash, yeah. legitimately at this point puts out these 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 they, they legitimately take my breath away with some of these polos that we put out with take unreal. my breath away Very Dude, they're these like tight fitting and they they do that one um design where it's just a million different like faint stool logos or now yeah. we have the b cross t logo and it make whoever, whatever that model is looks unbelievable that's me. That's, that's me that's <laughs> me yeah those are our body types if you couldn't tell. yeah that's, us. that's um, me that's us. a lot of good stuff in there riggs has oh, got it all riggs, 15 uh, what does pizza? riggs got there we got there oh that's the ain't no kevin hobby. kisner Jesus, the, it's a full ain't no hobby line. It's insane, bro. People, I, I already see so much ain't no hobby stuff out in the wild. I cannot believe it. Everybody's got a hat. Everybody's got a polo. Everybody's got a head cover. People love that shit, man. Kids hit me up. He's like, the sales got to be insane because it's fucking a couple weeks into this since we put on sale, and I'm seeing it at tournaments everywhere. So the ain't no hobby gear is maybe my favorite stuff. I actually hit up our merch team last week. Because they send us stuff a lot, but I actually hit them up and was like, hey, can you send me to my apartment every single Ain't No Hobby piece of merch that we make? Because I want every single piece. Because we keep putting it on sale. People keep tweeting at us from PGA Superstore these these skews, these items that I didn't even know that we have on sale. That I'm like, I have, I have to have that. So go to store.barcelsports.com. Father's Day collection is out. The rest of the foreplay merch, store.barcelsports.com. Click on the old foreplay. Click on golf. Go check out a bunch of our favorites. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're joined by um, we're joined by Taylor Montgomery, who's somebody we've been trying to schedule forever. Our schedules, your schedules, back and forth. Um, so we kind of kept missing, which I think is actually we need to keep doing that because I'm looking, and it's like every time I look, your top five, your T4, T4, finishing second, uh, rack it up racking up points and hopefully it's looking really good this year so far like you won't be uh the bubble boy when it comes to the corn fairy tour onto the pga tour is that is that right is that fair yeah yeah no it's uh definitely won't be the bubble boy this year it should be it should be our automatically locked even if i didn't play another tournament this year uh all of us think it's going to be around 750 points roughly so it's a it's a good feeling and instead of being 26. <laughs> so the reason I bring that up for anyone who doesn't know, um, Taylor's background is finished runner up last year, three times, I believe on the corn Ferry tour and then finished 26th in both the corn Ferry tour regular season, uh, finish points. And then, uh, also finish 
26th in the final standings. If you finish the top 25, you get your PGA Tour card. Um, so you've been the bubble boy, obviously playing phenomenal golf. Um, it's got to feel good and kind of, uh, you know, a little validation with such a good um, good start to the season so far. Yeah, no, it definitely, it feels good. Um, I First round of the year, uh, shot like 84 on a tough golf course in the Bahamas. And then I actually went to TaylorMade and got fit with irons for the first time. Uh, Smart. Smart. Been sponsored by TaylorMade for, they've been sending me stuff since high school and uh, never been fit for irons. So that was a little dumb on my part. And it's uh, changed my game quite a bit, to be honest. Wow. Look at that. So we're, we're big tailor made guys. Um, we've done the kingdom. We've done the fitting and the whole deal. I'm, I'm stunned that somebody like you in your position, you're just using stuff off the rack or what? Well, no, not really. I was always using that's 100s and, uh, in, in Vegas, like the ball was just flies so much different. We were at sea level down there in the Bahamas and Scott came up to me. He's like, wow, you're spinning your sits iron like a lot. And, so he's like, you need to come down to the kingdom. I shot 84 and then uh, got to the kingdom as soon as I could because I was playing in the farmers the very next week. And we hit probably 10 different shafts in a sits iron. And I ended up with the X100s, the 120s. They're supposed to be a little lower launching and a little lower spin. And they've been they've been great. I finished T11 at the Farmers, and then the game has just been a lot different ever since. Um, I feel like the Bahamas tournaments always always get a little crazy. It was a couple of years ago, right, where like the pin flags were blowing out of the holes. I feel like <laughs> that is the craziest golf course I've ever played. I mean, I think Greg Norman was the one who designed it, and. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but whoever designed it was was crazy. It's a good time if you want to throw Greg Norman under the bus. It's time to do it. Right. If you want to do it, you can. And no one's going to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why don't nope. you take it easy on Greg Norman? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, you can I'm, pile I'm, on. I'm, I'm interested to see what happens with all that stuff. I think a lot of guys are. It'll be be interesting. Yeah, somebody in your spot, uh, you know, have you – are, have you been approached? Do, are people in your circles being approached? Do you guys have any sort of, you know, uh, information or a different vantage point on it than than we do? Not that, not that I know of. Uh, uh-uh. and they haven't even came out with like who's playing uh, in the tournament coming up. I think it's in like two weeks, the first event. And, it's crazy. Uh, it'll be. They haven't came out with the uh, players and uh, who who's all playing, and that will be. That'll be very interesting because the PGA Tour obviously said that nobody's playing. Like, what's going to happen to the top 125 guys in all the spots on tour with uh, some of them going and playing that if they aren't allowed in another event? Right. And, I mean, you know, you're you're here. You've been grinding on Corn Ferry Tour. Like, we talked, the bubble and making it and you're except, But – you know, you could be one of those guys. I mean, you could go beat fucking Lee Westwood and make four million dollars <laughs> over. In, you know, I mean, come on. <laughs> you're, wait, are we? Prime, wait, you're a prime guy. Are we now recruiters for the Live Golf? I don't want to. I don't want to be that this, guy. Trent, we've brought up the situation many times of like, <laughs> you know, like John Rob's going to be looking at somebody that goes over there that you know he's ranked way higher than in the world that's making millions of dollars. I'm saying in a hypothetical world, Taylor, you could be a you could be a prime suspect. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't think I could ever take that risk uh, in my spot right now. But some guys will, and we'll see if it works out or if it doesn't. Be yeah, very we've debated it. We've debated it, talked about it for hours and hours and hours on this show. And it is, it almost seems like uh, in in, I wouldn't like you wouldn't even consider the risk at this point because of all that you stand to lose, not only status wise on the PGA tour, which clearly the tour did not grant permission for players to go over there and play in the live tour, but you know, sponsorship dollars, opportunities, reputation, your marketability, everything at this point, I think gets hurt pretty badly for anyone that decides to go over there. Yeah. And I just don't think a lot of people know like who's running the tour. Like if that guy decides to, stop running it i mean it's 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 done 
Like, yeah, nobody knows where his head's at, what he wants to do with uh, that league. It's a weird spot. It's a very weird spot. We got to talk about this putting. So you won a putting tournament for $75,000 yeah. in 2017. Is that true? Yeah, I got – it was – I was sponsored in the event by uh, the guy running it, and I got 20% of it. And then after that, I there was a bunch of different events. I uh, put myself uh, – I was able to buy my way into the tournament after that 15000 that I got. So I, I made a little bit more. I teamed up with uh, Kurt Kitayama in one of them, and him and I ended up winning. Uh, that was probably the most fun I've ever had in golf. That that little putting thing. So I mean, we're pretty we're pretty plugged in in the golf world. Where are these massive putting tournaments happening where people are winning seventy five thousand? That was where is this? So they were originally from Canada. And they came down. I knew nothing about it. I was driving the ball so bad in college or just after college and uh, just turned pro. And it was funny. All my buddies and I joked about like, man, if they had a putting tour, I would make so much money. And my dad ended up texting me. He's like, hey, go try to qualify for this thing. It's like $200 and you can supposedly win up to 75000 And I knew nothing about it. I knew it was behind the strip. It was like right uh, by Top Golf and Planet Hollywood, and when we got there, it was it was pretty sick. They had this giant stadium with a leaderboard, um, and it wasn't like a quirky putting course. It was like a legit um, putting track. So I missed a qualifier by one, and then the guy, I was like, ah, oh, shit. We'll keep on going, and maybe there's another one in a couple of days. It was like a two week stretch of just a bunch of things going on. And I. Oh no. Oh no. He cut out. His, his video went first and then, then the audio went, man, he was fine. He was. I feel like it was choppy or anything. Is he on a bed? I think he might've been on a bed. Yeah. Hmm. Here we go. There he is. You back? Sorry, I'm back. Sorry. No, no, you're all good. You were uh, you were right in the middle of the story. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're down there in the putting tournament. After I qualified, I missed by one. Uh, then the, the guy, his name was Guillaume, and he came up to me. He's like, hey, we're going to – we'd love to sponsor you in this event. And it, it's going down tomorrow night, uh, and you – we'll give you 20%. And so I went and signed a waiver and stuff and went up there, ended up winning. It was six round stroke play on this thing. And I ended up winning this thing and man, it was, it was awesome. They had a bar. Uh, there was a bunch of people there. Uh, the, some of the putting strokes that you saw were just unbelievable. They had these guys from a different country that I guess can like spin the ball on the green back home I, I saw some of the craziest with the stuff putters down there with the putters uh, spinning a ball is like impossible with a putter but i guess back home <laughs> they use a different type of ball and there's like a different type of mat so like you can like curve the ball around like obstacles and stuff i, I i'm i'm yet to see it they struggled a little bit so uh down yeah, here. <laughs> apparently because you just wiped the floor with a, uh, so <laughs> Was it like mini golf? Was it goofy? Do you have to putt around stuff? Or was it just like a no, normal, kind of a normal green? All of it was AstroTurf. And they all the holes, there's 18 holes. And they were they had two different tee boxes. So they could like change the tees around, uh, depending on what they wanted to do. And they were anywhere from five feet to about 60 feet. And it was, I mean, I wish I could show you guys a picture of it. It was such a cool stadium. Like it's probably... It was like just like a little arena with like stands and stuff, but the leaderboard was right there. They played music. So, I mean, some of the music was terrible, but anyways, <laughs> it, was, it was it was fun. Man, What's Kevin wild. Kisner doing on the PJ Tour if there's just a putting tour? Is like put on a <laughs> bunch of events, clear seventy five thousand, and just he could just. I mean, there's a lot of great putters out there, but if you're a great putter, like is this? Are there multiple events, or, or was this a one off, or how many events are there? There was probably. 10 to 12 events down there. Uh, and wow. the 75,000 one was the biggest one. 
which isn't high enough for Kevin Kisner. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, that is that is a fair point. Uh, so, I mean, these guys are putting, they're putting spin on the ball and all that. Were you, I mean, did you have to adopt weird stuff like that? Or did you just go in with yeah. your normal, I'm a good putter and I'm just going to beat you guys? So I did, I just went in the way I would like putt and like kind of read a putt. But the AstroTurf changed so much. So you're constantly adjusting because the more the people stepped on it, like in the morning, the green was probably running around a 10. At, at night, everybody was stepping on it and trampling down the grass. I mean, some pot, putts were impossible. They were running probably a 15, 16 on the stint meter. And you either made it or you had a 10-footer coming back. <laughs> Jesus. Unreal. Yeah. So you just had to make a ton of like 10-footers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because you're not going to make – my speed was really good on those things for as much as they adjusted. I think that's why uh, I was pretty consistent out there. Um, Man, did you have – I mean, I imagine you had some really nervy moments with the – you know, was it tight? Oh, yeah. Like, God. Yeah, I was just straight out of college, didn't have much money, and you're like putting for seven – I ended up winning probably – 35,000 that week. And I was like, this is the greatest week of my life. Like, no what the shit. hell just happened? <laughs> yeah. At that point, God, how, um, so how nerve wracking is, is Q school court late, you know, late stages of corn fairy tour, the season, the finals, because unlike the PJ tour, where those guys, sure. They're playing for a difference of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, but they're pretty set at that point, you know, you're fighting for your life. You're literally hitting putts. You know yeah. that you, you I imagine you're very tuned into precisely what this putt's going to mean. If I can pick up a stroke over these last five holes, it'll literally change my life and I'll have a whole different job next year at the, you know, at with the cream of the crop. I mean, that's got to be an unimaginable oh, uh, nerve. It's, it's way different. And I'm still learning on how to control like, like my thoughts in those situations. But I, I really think that's why I haven't won on the corn fairy yet. Um, Cause when you're inside the top five, uh, you know, like, especially for where, from where I was last year, I knew, I knew like every shot mattered when you're inside that top 25, the points are so huge or the top five, the points are just enormous. Um, so, you know, every shot that you mess up or gain is just astronomical. For example, in Dallas this year, I finished T4. I had an up and down on the 18th hole that would have put me in second place, tied for second. And I basically would have doubled my points for that week. I think I ended up getting like around 110 points for that event, and I would have got 95 more. So basically I had to finish another T4 or T5 just to get that up and down with just that one shot. And it's just so frustrating because, because it's such a long process uh, on a week of golf. It's like really just one, one little shot like that is a hundred and something points. So we do, I mean, it's crazy. It's, I can't, again, I can't even imagine that to the, to the effect that I, you know, I'm going to ask, like, we talk a lot about the mental approach, how mentally weak and pathetic we are, how we just run out of focus when we play golf. Cause we're pretty typical weekend golfers. Do you, are you working? Do you try from a mental standpoint to just block all of that out and not even really know? Because I imagine it's probably easier to perform your best and to pick up strokes if you don't know all of that, because then you get to just go about your business. 100%. Yeah. It's definitely, I mean, yeah, it, it, it'd be the best not to, not to know, but <laughs> well, when you're in the top dogs. five, you, you kind you kind of, you kind of know. Uh, I mean, it, it, it was so much easier this week, kind of knowing that, that I had my lo card locked up. Like you weren't thinking about anything like that. Um, and, and then now it's just like, try to, try to win. I mean, cause what else, what else do, does it matter? You're kind of going to the tour already and uh, getting prepared to that. But I mean, you still stick to like your same game plan. It's not like you play more aggressive or crazier. It just definitely like frees you up. Uh, so pl playing. 
talk to me about this part now because you got a whole you're entering a whole new world next year. PGA Tour, you got your PGA Tour card. You know now that, like you just said, pretty much mathematically done. You're going to have your PGA Tour card. How's the process go for you at this point for planning your schedule next year? What you're going to play in, what you're not going to play in? What factors do you consider courses, types of grasses, or you're not even to that point yet because you're trying to focus on your golf this year? Where are you at with that process? Well, I'm... Uh... I think I only have maybe three more corn fairy events this year. Uh, I'm going to go to Colorado, hang out with my uh, grandma and family. We're going to go ride some four wheelers and stuff and then yeah. kind of get back to it. in uh, August, my sister's getting married and then uh, we have the finals. The finals will be very important. Uh, just trying to get the top 25 guys uh, higher status because a lot of them don't even get into the tour events once you get your tour card unless you're up near the top 10 of, of those 25 guys that get their card so in terms of um you know how, how much how how well do you need to perform you need to be you're looking to be top 10 i imagine yeah you definitely want to be top 10 i mean first would you always look as a player. You're first always would be looking great. at first. First is nice. Yeah, because totally. you get into the players, you pretty much get into everything. So that would be that would be huge. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. What's the difference between ten and then the rest of the way? What's what's the difference? Um. Well, like for example, the Shriners uh, last year, my buddy David Lipsky, he should have got a exemption. Anyways, he's a local kid, but that didn't happen, and. Uh, I'm not sure what he finished. I want to say like 12th or right around there, but he didn't get into the uh, Shriners event based on his number of those top 25 guys. And he finished 12th. I mean, 12th is you're playing pretty damn good golf. Really good golf. <laughs> really good golf. You're a Vegas guy. You a Vegas Knights fan. Oh yeah. Yeah. Those games are awesome. Wish they would have played a little better this year, but you know, I, know, I was a little surprised because they're, They've been a bit of a juggernaut since they since they started, but they. Uh, I went to my first uh, night's game in December, and it's it's awesome. It's cool how the whole city yeah. is kind of rallied behind them, and they just embrace the Vegas thing. It's right. It's not. It's not Madison Square Garden. It's not going to the Garden in Boston. It's like no, no. This is a Vegas hockey team. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 a lot of fun down there. We know some guys uh, here in town that get us tickets, so. Got to thank them for getting me down there or else I wouldn't be going. The tickets are pretty expensive. You are, um, you're a Vegas guy, you know, born and raised. You and LV, you live there now. Are you like a big, are you a party animal? Do you stay away from the strip? How does that work if you're a Vegas local? No, definitely not a party animal. But uh, MGM gives you don't me seem like a it. You sponsorship seem like you're, deal. <laughs> a little more chill. You seem pretty chill, yeah. pretty even keel, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Not nothing really – bugs me to be honest but uh what's really fun here in vegas Must is going nice. down with like all the food and stuff uh mgm has a sponsorship deal so we go down there and eat uh, all the restaurants and go to the spa so that's always fun oh yeah man there are some good some good restaurants uh yeah in vegas catch a little sushi action yeah that's a great catch spot. is really good one of my favorites has always been uh stack uh, Ooh, which one's stack? It's been stacks like a steakhouse, but it's the appetizers are unbelievable. That, that's what that's what I like to do. We we go and it's kind of like family style meal. You just oh, yeah. order a bunch and yeah. just eat a bunch of everything. Who's the? Are you the orderer? Or you got somebody in your crew that's kind of the lead lead pony. No, normally normally I order because okay. right. nobody else orders enough. <laughs> Yeah, you got to be an over order if you're the if you're yeah. the guy. You know, just I like just one menu shows up, give it to that guy, yep. and then yeah. I like to be the person at the t who's just I'm having a couple of drinks. All of a sudden, this appetizer comes. You get a little rigatoni comes. You get a little mac and cheese yeah. starts to show up. Maybe uh, also we have, you, you got to play the hot hand night. too. I remember when we were in um, where were we? Uh, Tulsa, I think it was. And Frankie, the other guy on this show, he just had the hot hand. Like we had been to a couple of restaurants and he was just firing. We had gone to an Italian place yeah. the night before, a seafood place the night before that. And he was just on fire like NBA jam. And we just kept giving him the menu because, 
you know, if you're, if you're, if you got a guy in that position, just keep giving it to him until he orders, you know, some cauliflower bullshit. And then it goes to the next guy. But if someone's doing it well, yeah. keep going to them. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like uh, that. Yeah. Vegas has good food, really good food. Um, well, it sounds like you got a great, sounds like you got a nice summer coming, coming up. My parents live in, uh, in Boulder. So I, those Colorado summers are, uh, they're to die for, to be honest with you. Yeah, no, there, there's nothing better. I I, I got to get back because last year I was on the bubble, so I didn't really get to spend much time out there. I was grinding and trying to get my card, <laughs> so it was kind of brutal. Yeah, it was a little different. Uh, well, I love it. I love the perspective. Uh, I like that you you know you just kept battling and played really well this year. You're winning putting contests to keep your career alive. <laughs> you got PGA Tour card coming, so. Uh, where so yeah where are you right now where are you sitting right now the the i've been trying to figure out the whole time you've been on you got sleep behind you you look like you got a bed frame yeah. behind you where are you yep i'm just in my room back at home okay. i don't really have an office so this was the best spot i could find and and the best wi-fi even though it cut out on us that's what i was gonna <laughs> guess i was gonna guess best wi-fi i do that you know hotels or like when i go to you know sometimes i go visit my brother in st louis and i just I have to post up right in the middle of their kitchen because it's where they have the best Wi-Fi, and I just take over the whole house for like an hour. It's very yeah. It's kind of embarrassing to be honest with you. <laughs> That's awesome. You got to find the good Wi-Fi. Um, yeah, Trent. It says eat, sleep, golf behind him. I was wondering. Yep. I could. I, I couldn't see the words. I can see sleep, and I could see G O L, and I was just. I was entranced by it the whole time while we were while we were talking. I couldn't quite get there with the G O L. You what? You, you think that was Gollum? God. <laughs> I, I thought maybe gold. I, I had gold in my head. I didn't know. Gold's eat, a good sleep, one. Vegas. Golf. Yeah. Eat, sleep, I golf. Wish. Makes... <laughs> that's a golf guy right there. Yeah, that's he's just got eat, sleep, golf behind him when he when he wakes up. I Love like it. That. Oh, I like it too. a lot. Well, Taylor, we appreciate it. Good luck in uh, finals, PGA Tour. Everything will be obviously following your career. Very cool perspective of uh, of obviously your career where you're at and. You know, we appreciate it. We really do. No, thank you guys. Appreciate you guys uh, reaching out and having me on the show. Of course. Good luck out there. Thank you very much. Yeah, man. Thanks Talk for the time. Soon. Thank you, guys.